Thank you very much. I know there are a few more people who will be coming and I'll leave the door open. It's pretty quiet out there. Um, so let me just say welcome and I'm Nancy Donaldson, the director of the ILO Washington office. If there's anyone here who has joined us since this morning. And I'm very honored to introduce Janice Balacci. She is the Samuel Blank Professor of Legal Studies and Professor of Legal Studies and Management at the Wharton School at University of Pennsylvania. And equally important to ILO, she served on the ILO Committee of Experts for five, fif oh, 15 years, excuse me, from 1995 to 2010. Uh, and at the end of that period was the chair of the Committee of Experts. So as a respectful but non-Catholic, I'll say, I always thought of them as the Holy See of the ILO, uh, highly revered in the world. And I will ask Janice to tell you a little bit about how that work is in the ILO. And she's going to give you her unique Janice Palachi approach to the world, which is very dynamic. But I just do want to say something that I think everyone here knows. But the ILO is the only, it's a specialized UN agency, and is the only agency that has tripartite governance at every level as a multilateral. So we have 183 member countries. And we have delegations of business employers, workers, and government that come every year to our International Labor Conference, which is the lawmaking body uh, as one of its functions. And we even have some people here who go to those meetings. Um, our governance structure is we are governed by business, labor, and government officials. And our standards that we'll, you'll hear more about from Janice are negotiated between these real partners of the economy. And that makes us just a very different and still and even more so dynamic multilateral institution despite our age <laughs> since 1919. So Janice, I, I won't take any more of your time. We're so excited you're here. Thank you for coming up on train from <laughs> Philadelphia. Thank you. I have uh, many friends in the audience, so I expect good questions, I should say. When you were mentioning the Holy See, one thing I'll say about the Committee of Experts and its uh, place of esteem at the ILO is the, uh, the ILO has a huge and uh, I consider good looking uh, building, uh, very modern, built in 1970, it's up on a hill. And there is a room that is reserved for the Committee of Experts, which has a beautiful round table as a gift, wood, oh, a beautiful table. But as you walk in, the foyer part outside the room is something in the corner. Many international organizations and personages get gifts. Somebody comes, they give them a gift. Don't ask me where they stick all these gifts because they have no need for them. Uh, but the gift that was put there was a gift for, from Pope John Paul uh, II. And, uh, it's there as a gift when the ILO got, I think, the, I forget, what the Nobel Prize, but they consider it so important. So I consider it the Holy See as we walk in, and it always says private. Oh, so I don't, I can put it back? Yeah, okay. Okay. It is, yeah. That's right, it says an observer, because it's not a, well, never mind, <laughs> so technical. You know, looking at today's conference, it struck me, um, looking at this title about the, you know, the judiciary, that the mindset of those in the American legal system, both judges and lawyers, has to change. And I don't think, when I wrote that, I thought that was a bit presumptuous, but then I saw in the briefing book, uh, Justice O'Connor's speech, 2002 speech, to the American Society of International Law, where she says that even though she's one of the most learned people in American, she doesn't say that, she is one of the most learned people in American law, that she knows very, she knew very little about international law. And so coming to them to speak, she felt humbled. But it was, I considered a very straightforward admission that a person of her age who went to law school 
virtually learned nothing about international law. And I think many people in the room who are close to me in age will have the same experience. Many of us learned the law at a time when national borders were the boundaries of our mental world in law school. But today, that way of thinking makes one a dinosaur in a global, globalized world. We use the word globalization so often nowadays. So I just want to mention a couple things to make it come home. I was at a conference last week in Italy, and I was talking about modernization of labor. This was not a law conference strictly, it was labor relations. And to highlight the paradigm change that we must confront, I set out some of the key timelines of the last 40 years. 1970 was the first use of the internet, except by the people who were developing it. And it was research universities only that had access to it. 1974 was the development of the Intel 8080 microprocessor, which is what fueled the development of the personal computer. I mentioned that because I was at the London School of Economics and in a course I was given to read the impact of microprocessors on employment. And I remember thinking, I don't have a clue what a microprocessor is, let alone what impact this will have on employment. The same year, 1974, was the first use of the barcode scanner in a retail store. I mean, I'll think about this, you go in a hospital and they track you as a patient. But think of that impact on the way we work and employment. 1976, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak developed the Apple I. Actually, Apple II was the big breakthrough, but you could see two years after that microprocessor, they start figuring out how to do it, a personal computer. In 1982, modern email appears. You know that SMTP? That's modern email. And then I'll jump ahead to 1993, the development of the World Wide Web. I mentioned that because before that, most people could not use the internet because it was so arcane, the codes. But with the World Wide Web, the normal person in an office could use it. And desktop computers came in, and just within a very short time, everything changed. So we had this tremendous technological change that made possible the phenomenon we call globalization. And I say made possible. It's because communication across oceans that have been tremendously difficult, expensive, and time-consuming became easy, fast, and cheap. It struck me last night, I sent an email to somebody in Singapore to, to set up a time for a telephone call, and I sent, sent it at 8.30 p.m. last night, and I got my answer within an hour. Think of that 25, 30 years ago. It would have taken like 10 days to figure this out by airmail. And Tax, so you might say, we always think of globalization and trade, but globalization partly is communication. If you can't communicate, you can't figure out how to buy and sell. Right. But there are other barriers to buying and selling. And we all know that the barriers have lowered, were completely dropped almost in 1995 when the WTO opened its doors. And by the way, if you're in Geneva, you think of that a lot because the WTO is actually in the building that was the first ILO headquarters. So at this conference in Italy, I stress that laws and institutional arrangements made in a pre-global age may no longer work. We physically sit in one country, but we're not closed to the world. The reality of what happens elsewhere, where the products are made, and how much they sell for in our market as a result, that reality intrudes into our world. And the one example I give is Apple. We know this extremely profitable company. Some of you may have read that uh, a couple months ago, Apple reported its earnings for the fourth quarter of 2011. Its profits, not its earnings, its profits were $13 billion. Two, about two weeks ago, uh, Apple released the new iPad 3, and over the first weekend, a record 3 million were sold. And this year, Apple is likely to pass ExxonMobil as the most profitable corporation in the Fortune 500. Well, that's really a change. So, so that's wonderful. American company, technological marvel. But take note, in 2001, China joined the WTO. In the last 10 years, Apple has moved all of its manufacturing out of the United States. 
mostly to China, Taiwan also, a couple other places. And Apple has followed the path of many others. Most components of Apple products are made and assembled by other companies. So, in a sense, Apple has no direct employment relationship with the workers who make its products. And some of you will know from reading the New York Times, but actually it was a Hong Kong NGO that uh, put the spotlight on this, that one of its main suppliers has had some labor problems. You know you're having labor problems if your workers are jumping out the windows and committing suicide, that the conditions are bad. Um, reminds me of, by the way, as an aside for the real historians in the room, John D. Rockefeller II and the Colorado Arn and Fuel Massacre. It was Standard Oil that owned it. And the son, John D. Rockefeller, said, basically, Dad, I don't think our workers like us if we have to shoot them in the back. <laughs> but um, which when they start to stay there. So we look at the issue of Apple's products. And if, we, if you're concerned about how they're made, what's the length of the working day, is it safe, or is there crowding in the living, the dorms, the workers' dorms, or the child labor? If you're concerned about that, which benchmark do we use? Do we use American law? Do we use Chinese law or Taiwanese law? Do we use international law? And regardless of which law, who will enforce it and where? So that's what I meant about globalization has really just broken, has, we have to break any mental barriers we have and say we're in a global world. We have to think about these issues differently than we did 30 years ago. I teach in a business school, which has certain pluses and certain minuses, but I teach a course that if I had offered it 20 years ago, I don't think anyone would have signed up. I teach a course called International Human Rights Law and Globalization. And I get plenty of students. And I just said, my students, my undergraduates, they get it immediately. They see that it would be arrogant or imperialistic to apply American law to that factory in China. But they also see that the other country may have low labor standards or maybe it lacks enforcement. They quickly conclude that if business operates globally, then international land labor standards make sense. That really strikes me. They're very pragmatic. Well, business is going to operate globally, and if something's made here, and part of it's made there, and part of it made there, well, it makes sense to have some international standards. And I'll come back to that. But let me turn briefly a bit to uh, American courts and international law, which has been handled by others and I think will be handled again, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But I do think that over the, over the 20th century, the United States actually began to look less at other countries than had been done in the 19th century. We at least used to look at British law. If you go read 19th century cases, you see it. And then it sort of stops. And as we all know, that in some quarters, there is an antipathy to international law. Um, some of you may have read Mary Ellen O'Connell's The Power and Purpose of International Law. It's a very readable book and she sort of gives some of the reasons. The American Heritage Foundation piece in the briefing book reminded me of this. Some perceive that international institutions try to constrain what the USA wants to do. And, or, that these international institutions are dominated by countries that do not embrace free markets and thus represent a view of the world that is counter to our underlying values. And you get that. I mean, you read, if you read the American Heritage Foundation piece, you'll see that there's this view that seeps in. That somehow they don't think the way we do. Their values aren't our values. It would constrain us. So there's almost um, a, a natural, I don't know, hostility might be too strong a word, but uh, certainly they don't embrace it. So where's, so when you think about international law, and I'll just say briefly, I think most of us who have been out of school quite some time didn't see much of it in law school unless you took a special course in it. Um, I, had, I had, you wouldn't believe it, four courses in labor law in law school. I'm unusual. Uh, Penn required, used to require it in first year. So I took four courses. I had the widely used Cox and Bach case book, eighth edition. There was not one mention of the ILO or other international standards in that book. I checked 
last night just to make sure. Very heavily underlined book. I thought I'd memorize it, but it's not one mention. In all those courses I took, there was not one mention of the ILO. And I consider that peculiar when one remembers that the United States was instrumental in the founding of the ILO, that the first international labor conference in 1920 was held in Washington, D.C., and that Francis Perkins, as Secretary of Labor, was instrumental in the United States joining the ILO in 1934, particularly because of some of the um, legislation she was interested in, like the Social Security Act, et cetera, matched ILO standards. Not matched, but she considered it a natural affiliation to make. So to me, this omission of mention of the ILO and international labor law is important because it reveals the underlying belief that American labor law represents a power balance struck by Congress during a period of conflict in the 1930s. In other words, it's not like some fundamental rights. Now, I know what Section 7 says, and I know some of us may believe that, but I think a good section of American lawyers and judges see it as a congressionally uh, mandated arrangement, not that there are fundamental human rights involved. And as such, it's really only relevant to look at American, the statutes, the cases, the regulations. It's, what are you looking at other things for? In fact, and you might say, well, why would you, some people might say, why would you, did you ever see it mentioned? You might have, when it came up in a case, like picketing cases, you might see a constitutional argument coming up, by the way. And the, I was gonna say you didn't see it in the Constitution either, but a constitutional argument crops up when it comes to property rights. So, and even then, even then, if you're mentioning a constitutional argument in a labor and employment case, we never had any comparative dimension to that discussion. In fact, recently in my department, my department is legal studies and business ethics, which means things like corporate social responsibility. And we were having a discussion about different notions of private property in advanced market economies. And I was pointing out to some of my colleagues and I'll point it out in a second. It can be very different in countries that we consider nice capitalist countries. I was going to mention something else about the Constitution. You know, in critiquing the Constitution, professors might mention the originally the diminished state of uh, black persons or women or children, of course, in the Constitution. Do you know I never heard anyone mention that the United States Constitution, compared to the constitutions of some other countries, is notably silent with regard to the rights of working persons. There's nothing in it about the, and you may say, what do you mean? Well, you could mean the extremes, like Italy in its constitution has a right to strike. I once remember at an American Bar Association meeting in Italy, somebody uh, quest asking one of the speakers about this, sort of asked about the limits, and he said, it's a fundamental human right. Even judges in Italy go on strike. <laughs> so, so. Um, and let me read you part of Article 9 of the German Const Federal Constitution. It says, starts out, all Germans have the right to form associations and societies. Then you jump down, it says, subparagraph 3. The right to form associations to safeguard and improve working and economic conditions is guaranteed to everyone and to all trades and professions. Agreements which restrict or seek to hinder this right are null and void. Measures directed to this end are illegal. It goes on a little bit about industrial conflict. So you can, that's a pretty strong statement in their constitution. We have nothing. Well, it's not surprising. I don't think it is. The United States Constitution was written in the late 1780s, before the Industrial Revolution. And frankly, if you th it was written by persons that today we might call the 1%. <laughs> I mean, there was master and servant law in Britain. They just weren't thinking about those servants. In fact, I could even go further, and somebody wants to ask me afterwards, bonded labor is considered usually a form of forced labor. And Britain, to get, would induce people that, who were in debtors and convict, you know, convicts in debtor prisons. If you want to get out, you can, you can be bonded labor, and they'd ship them off to Georgia 
by the way, during the Revolutionary War, they were totally stuck, and that's why they had to send somebody out to Australia, because they couldn't send them here anymore. Now, we know about bonded labor. There's nothing in the Constitution. So think about it. There were things that existed that just sort of were below on the radar screen, flew below their, their uh, perception in the Constitution. So when we look at the Constitution, and of course I love the Constitution, but we have to say that there are things that if we were writing it today that are not covered, and the rights of working people might be covered, especially if we looked at other modern constitutions. As has been mentioned, I'm sure already, we have a schizophrenic approach to international law. The courts often acknowledge that it exists, but then they stand back and they don't want to embrace it. So you start saying things about international law, da, 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 and they start saying, well, but it's not precise, or we can go on and on about it. So we look at it and say, where does this come from? There's an excellent article, and I'm going to tell Nancy about it, you know, for anybody who's, especially professors who might be interested, that was written in a book um, when somebody retires. They, they write a book sometimes in some European countries, and when uh, Nicholas Valtikos, who was an extraordinary comparative labor law scholar at the ILO, retired people wrote a book. And there's a chapter about the use of ILO standards in binational courts. It's written at Constance Thomas and Xavier Baudinet uh, were the authors of that. And I have the chapter. I don't have the citation, but I just have the chapter so I, we can get it. Um, but they have to talk a little bit about the attitude of national courts to international law. And they, they note that essentially if you did a spectrum on one side, the easier one side for me is uh, what they call, and I didn't know the word, monism, some of you may know this, and that's the group of countries that take the view that the, um, the legal order is one, one thing, and the legal order has both domestic and international law in it, in the legal order, and therefore, um, if a country has ratified conventions, signed treaties, the, that the, it's automatically in domestic law because it's only one legal order. So that's the monist view. And you find it, particularly in civil law countries, a good part of Europe and South, almost all of South America. Now, you find this, by the way, in, Ger in the German constitution. They say that public international law is a part of German law. At the other extreme, and I say this is a, a spectrum, are uh, countries that are called dualists, and they think that there's two distinct legal orders, that here's international law and here's domestic law, and, um, and essentially, even if you have ratified a convention, to have it apply domestically, there probably has to be a statute or something. Uh, that would make it applicable domestically. That's the extreme view, and the USA is one of them. Um, but it's the common law countries, but most of them are not as extreme as we are. And that's why I said it's a spectrum. Okay. It's a spectrum where you, uh, that's like my students in class when they're supposed to be taking notes. <laughs> and you hear something like that. Um, and, you know, it varies. But I do mention that. So with the, um, the principle that that national law should be interpreted in light of obligations arising from these, uh, from conventions. The willingness of courts to take that view almost reflects that spectrum. If they're deep on the monist side, of course they're going to say we do, and if they're deep on the dualist side, you're going to see this reluctance. And in the United States, I think, when we look at rights that apply to labor, um, you see something that we don't, usually discuss in law schools. As you know, after the Universal Declaration of Human Rights was adopted, it took about 20 years before the two international covenants were finally adopted. The United States ratified the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights with some uh, saying they didn't like certain parts of it. But we never ratified the International Covenant of Economic, Cultural, and Social Rights. And I think generally, among actually the population, but particularly lawyers, there's an awareness that there are these civil and political rights that free nations should embrace. You get a lot of pushback from certain people when you start mentioning economic rights. They just don't think that these are human rights. And a freedom of association at the workplace 
is one of those. So in the United States, you see this particular reluctance. Slavery is one thing, uh, you know, violation of human dignity, but freedom of association is another thing. I already mentioned, and I'll just, just quickly say this again, that in our Constitution, this issue of, of tilting the balance, that we have private property rights, we have nothing explicit about working person's rights. We do have something explicit about private property rights. And so if there's a case that, case where the employer makes an argument that its private property rights are being infringed and it's at the constitutional level, what does the lawyer for the other side argue? There's not much you can find in the Constitution. And that's what I meant by sort of implicitly tilting the balance. And it's also the way we phrase it. The Fifth Amendment says, no person shall be deprived of da, 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 life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. That's it. So like, it's almost like an unqualified right of private property. The German Constitution says, Property, by the way, this is a translation and I've read it in various, the thought's the same, but the words can be a little different. Property and the rights of inheritance are guaranteed. Their content and limits are determined by the laws. Second paragraph, property imposes duties. Its use shall also serve the public good. I've also seen that like the bit. This was very important in the case uh, that determined the constitutionality of the 1976 co-determination law. That was the key paragraph. Some of you may know that on the boards, that first of all, German public companies have two level boards. The top board, the supervisory board, has both shareholders, directors, and they might say employees, directors, worker directors. The 1976 law changed the percentages and said that the workers get 50%. It's a little more complicated than that, but they get 50%, the shareholders get 50%, and there's the chair who has the tie-breaking vote, who was always a shareholder's uh, representative. And that was challenged in the Constitutional Court on the grounds that it deprived employers of their private property, and the German highest court said no, under Article 14, uh, it is permissible for the Bundestag to, um, to consider the public good and limit the use of private property. Consider that in the United States when we had HALs, when the UAW got one worker, director in a sense, on the board of Chrysler, as I recall, one. And this is 50%. So that's a different view about private property. Going back to what I was saying is what strikes me today in my teaching among to young people growing up in a globalized world, they're not offended by the German Constitution's provisions. They sort of find it interesting. To them, it's similar to notions, now you might not think so, but to them, to similar to notions of corporate social responsibility and discussions of which stakeholders the corporation should consider. And in almost any course on CSR, you say, well, you should consider your workers. So although they admit it's quite different than the United States, it doesn't sound totally alien uh, to them. But what the students search for are binding international standards which are enforced. Because to them, this is the level playing ground. And they say, okay, if we're all playing by the same rules, then we can compete in a globalized world. But we should be playing by the same rules. You can't ask, ask us to be good and they're going to be bad. So they get it fast. And it's here that the ILO has an immensely useful role to play. As you know, the ILO will soon reach its 100th year. And I was, about a year ago, I was, doing the research that's produced this article, I bought a few copies. Not that it's fantastic, but, <laughs> but it's interesting. And I began reading about the founding of the ILO, and I was struck by how truly modern the concerns were that were listed in 1919. I was also incredibly impressed by the vision of one man who left an indelible imprint on the ILO. He could have been in one man's strategic management consulting company. So let me explain this just briefly, because it says something about the structure and the enduring structure of the ILO. It was September 1918, the British are sitting there, you know, in Whitehall, and they're saying in the ministry, you know, the war's going to end. Americans have come in, it's going to end soon. And when it ends, there's going to be a peace conference, 
and they basically said, we don't want the French to get everything, so we better be prepared before we get over there. And it's really, it's exactly it. And they, uh, on one issue, they turned around to this person who's named Edward Phelan, young guy, and they said, okay, could you draft us uh, the text for the section, a section that will deal with the labor problem? In quotation marks. Everybody called it the labor problem which a lot of Americans forget that at the time, just before the First World War, there was tremendous unrest in Europe with the industrialization, people working long hours, people just feeling that they were basically being enslaved to some extent. Okay, so he sat down, very bright man. He was a pragmatist, and he knew that fine words in a peace treaty would not be sufficient to quell worker unrest. By the way, only six months before, the British had sent him to St. Petersburg right after the revolution in the middle of winter and said, could you get in undercover and see what's going on up there? We hear the czar has toppled. And he saw those scenes you see in uh, Dr. Zhivago. Couldn't believe it, what it was like. So he comes back and he says, wait a moment, this is really serious. Having studied economics, he also knew that competition led employers and countries to push down wages and working conditions. And he realized, he saw that there was no way that only that any one country could improve working conditions in the face of competition. This led him to conceive of an international organization where member states would agree on certain standards. And for those standards to be more than mere words, they had to be binding. So he proposed legally binding conventions. This is all written in an office in the fall of 1918 in London. And from the field work he had done uh, for the ministry, which was the Board of Trade, in very grimy industrial districts in Scotland, Phelan realized that to be capable of being implemented, standards had to be precise. And the only way to set precise standards was to include in the discussions people who really understood on the ground conditions, that is, employers and workers. And as a result, he made an extraordinary proposal. The ILO should be a tripartite organization. Not only would governments have a vote, but so also would employers and workers' representatives. That's what the British walked into the peace treaty conference with, that proposal. It went through so fast, you can't believe it. So if you read this, you'll see. I mean, it's really amazing. They came prepared. This guy just thought about it. They said, yep, fine. That's it. That was 1919, 1920 is the first International Labor Conference. The only thing they did is they gave governments two votes instead of one. But. So the basic planks of his architecture remain today. The ILO is a tripartite organization, and I have to stress that the feature gives it enormous legitimacy, uh, much more than the UN has in many parts of the world. Why? Imagine you lived in a part of the world where your government's corrupt and maybe kills people. Of course, and that's the government that goes to the UN. Maybe it sits on the Human Rights Council. So you're a little skeptical about this. But at the ILO, your country is represented by three constituencies. And whatever the government may say, they can say what they want. But in the ILO, other voices will speak up and disagree. Moreover, and this may surprise some of you, uh, the employer and worker representatives tend to be much more concerned with substance of the, conve with the proposed convention. What will actually work in practice and what the effect of a convention will be. I know that's surprised. People always assume that, um, that the workers and the, and, the, and the employers are always like at the opposite sides. And often you get more... Uh, agreement on many things because they're much more practical than a government who has a political uh, objective. However, the ILO is an international organization. Countries participate in a sense voluntarily. The ILO strives to persuade member states to ratify conventions that the International Labor Conference has adopted. And once they're ratified, the ILO strives to persuade member states to abide by the provisions of the convention. And as we all know, it doesn't have police or inspectors or an army. So it's very, very important, this moral uh, legitimacy and its ability to persuade the governments to do certain things. Turning to the Committee of Experts, uh, which 
in, the, in ILO parlance is called the highest supervisory body. There's all special language, which to Americans sounds odd, and sometimes it's French, and sometimes it's just odd. But uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, we're not you can't call judges. So what do you call the people who basically read the papers and say you're not complying? Well, they call it the highest super or the supervisory body. Um, as you would guess, uh, when the ILO was formed, the one thing Phelan didn't think about was this issue. What are you going to do about complaints <laughs> when you, people have ratified conventions, governments have ratified conventions, and they don't abide by them? And that happened really fast. I mean, convention number one is the eight-hour day. Very fast. People had ratified it, and then they did nothing. So in 1926, uh, the, the um, conference established the Committee of Experts. The full title is the Committee of Experts on the Application of Conventions and Recommendations. And it was for the purpose of reviewing reports submitted by governments who had ratified a convention and then deciding uh, whether they were complying. There's an interesting word that's used. In one way, I don't like it because it sounds so mild. It's called application, on the application of conventions. On the other hand, I can't think of a better word in English. It actually comes from the French. It means, in practice, are you actually applying the provisions? Are they realized? Are they operable? Are they implemented? We can think of various words. And application is what is the word that's used. So whatever is said, whatever your laws say, if you have enacted laws, for instance, what's actually happening? At present, the Committee of Experts is composed of 20 independent, and they use the word jurists, which means judges or lawyers, from around the world. And I should say, this is important, they are independent in that they are not representatives of their country, nor are they nominated by their government. So unlike many other UN bodies, for instance, you will, if you go online and look and say, how are people chosen to be on any of the other supervisory bodies you'll see they're nominated by governments. And that's not the case at the ILO. Because in 1926, they didn't think it was a good idea. And actually, it's not, but we'll skip that. Um, I'd only say as a funny aside, one day I said uh, to somebody there, I said, well, if you're not, if you're truly independent, I've been told that if the government really finds you intolerable, you, you uh, won't be nominated. And the person said to me, he said, the person has to get out of the country. He said, if you are true, if the truly government really does not want you, you might not be able to get out of the country, or you might not be able to get back in. So we do have to consider that. Once again, you're an American, doesn't even, you don't even think of this. Uh, uh, when a vacancy, by the way, just, it's, it's like, this is sort of secret, but when a vacancy occurs, uh, what happens is they sort of look, what sort of part of the world does the person come from? You know, this whole balance, linguistic balance, geographic balance, now gender balance, et cetera. All these factors enter into it. And the director of the relevant section of the ILO, which is called norm, which is the French word for sort of standards, but I almost like norm better because norms, I think, more expresses what they want, uh, identifies appropriate uh, candidates. And after interviews and various soundings, uh, makes recommendations to the director general. And then the director general uh, puts the nomination before the governing body and asks for approval. And frankly, I've been told that in the last uh, so many years, there's, the governing body has always agreed. So that's another very important thing about the ILO. It's um, unlike some of the other things, there's no fights. Like it's sort of said, okay, if the person's made it here, we can mumble about them, but we basically say yes. So it gives the Committee of Experts uh, insulation from some of the political tensions that some supervisory bodies in other UN agencies face. Um, and one other thing, if they're discussing your country and criticizing it, well, even if they're praising it, but particularly if they're criticizing it, by tradition, the member from that country does not speak. This is to, uh, it's, you, know, you might think, well, it's so they don't want the person to defend the country, but actually it's to protect the person, uh, regardless of what they say, particularly if they're criticizing their own country. So that is the tradition. At present, and this wasn't always the case, this is more modern, the members of the committee limit, voluntarily limit their service to 15 years. 
we used, there used to be people that stay home for 30 years. Uh, we voluntarily limit it. We say we will not accept another appointment after 15 years, and that is to permit renewal of the committee. And as Nancy mentioned, I was on it for 15 years. I was uh, succeeded Ben Aaron, one of, one, you know, so to say, one of the people I most highly respect and had the pleasure of working with for many years on the UAW Public Review Board. Uh, and in my final two years, I was chair of the committee. And I want to point out one thing that I'm really proud of. I was the first American in the 80-year committee, 80-year history of the committee to chair that committee. And um, in fact, so I, it's a big thing for an American uh, to be considered, I don't know, neutral enough to do it. And on my time on the committee, I was uh, every member of the committee, as we work, is assigned to be the primary rapporteur on co certain conventions. In other words, you have to read every single, the files, all the files of, from the government reports on that, received for that convention. And then when the committee convenes, you report on it. People have tr are supposed to have read it, but I mean the primary one is, is uh, there reporting and answering questions. And in my time, I was very fortunate to be the uh, primary rapporteur on three of the core conventions, 100, which is equal remuneration, 87, freedom of association, and 98, collective bargaining. Um, and I, it was incredible. It's difficult for me to convey how difficult and challenging it is to be a member of the Committee of Experts. It's one of the toughest things I've ever done. As an American lawyer, the initial challenge is to try to comprehend the thinking of civil lawyers. It may amuse you to learn that it was much easier for an American member to understand the line of argument of the Nigerian member than to comprehend the line of argument of the French member, simply because one would argue like the, the line of reasoning of a civil lawyer and the common lawyers talk the same language. My colleague from Sierra Leone and myself were the two people who usually quickly agreed on a working party about employment conventions for the same reason, both common lawyers, despite the astounding differences in the economic and political circumstances of our two countries. So those of you, most of you are lawyers, I think, you just can't imagine what it's like to sit there and hear a line of argument that, number one, not only would occur to you, that comes out of a civil lawyer, but you can't even figure out sometimes, or doctrines we don't have. Civil law has a doctrine called abuse of right. I thought it was abusive right first, because it's like one word, abusive right, but this abuse of right. And in civil law, it seems that you can have rights, but you can't abuse them. And if you do, the court will say, well, you had a right, but you abused it, so you lose. So, I mean, it's completely unheard of in our system. A little bit in equity, but we'll skip that. Um, so there's first is the legal system difference. The second is the language difference. This would probably occur to you, but it's huge. The ILO has three official languages, English, French, and Spanish. When I started, I would say French was more dominant among the committee. Luckily, by the end, it became English. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, for some, a good number of the committee are speaking in a second or third language. Remember, our Portuguese member is speaking in his third language when he's speaking English. So that's a difficulty. But really, it's the use of language as lawyers. Uh, we're dealing with technical legal matters where precision is important. Here I can only say that the simultaneous interpreters at the ILO, ILO are fabulous. I mean, they really are. The best I've ever encountered. They are so good that they could note when they themselves could not understand something well enough to translate. So the, what the, this is what they would do. I'll give you an example. Um, the person translating English into Spanish would say, the American expert just said laid off. Someone should ask her whether she means made redundant, dismissed, or simply laid off for a short time. So the, tran you know, the interpreter listening says, I can't translate that into Spanish because I don't know what she means because American English doesn't make this distinction. By the way, they're British English. So she knew British English from American English. And that was the Convention 158 discussion. I and they're like this all the time. So, uh, and you're listening so carefully, and the interpreters are so important, but you are listening through interpretation. At times, the problem was terminology, because when you describe a situation, um, if you say a yellow dog, con well, a yellow dog contract's not a great example, a wildcat strike, well, you're describing, that's a short label for an entire legal situation. So can you have a wildcat strike? In even another English-speaking country? That's a difficult term to translate. I remember once on a Convention 87 issue, 
uh, at the table having a really long discussion among the American, British, South African, and Australian members about what it means for an employer to recognize a union. It was just, it was just among the English, the common law countries, in a sense, we're having this discussion. Civil lawyers were sort of sitting there fascinated. At other times, the divide among experts relates, related more to a very different, to very different and deeply held notions about the appropriate role of the state. And I can still remember in a Convention 29 forced labor discussion, the French expert passionately declaring that to hold a person as a prisoner was a function that only the state could exercise. And it was not one that could be subcontracted out to a private entity. But I mean, it was something about the state has this role. And it, you know, just, it, it, I, I can't explain it more eloquently, you know, articulately that. But it's something that Americans don't have. If anything, we don't think the state should be doing very much. And they think the state's all powerful. So you can see that distinction. And at times, culture. Culture is, of course, there's different cultures. But it's, they're so different that unknowingly one makes a mistake. And I, I laugh, this is under Convention 111, non-discrimination. It was an instance where a country said that a married woman, the statute said, that a married woman could work at night, but could only do so if she had her husband's permission. And with unmarried adult woman, she needed her father's permission. So obviously, this offends you know, sex, gender equality. And, um, but trying to figure out what we should say, I suggested that a country might say that the head of the household must give permission for a person in the household to work at night. And next to me was my uh, colleague from the rich Arab country. And he laughed. He leaned over and he said, good try. It makes no difference. In Islam, the husband is always the head of the household. <laughs> you know? So that was a, a really fun. OK, well, I guess I better study that one. Uh, so I'm, these, the language and the, and the cultural and the way of thinking about the role of the state, all these things and this legal system differences really makes the work very challenging but incredibly uh, enriching. I can only say that it's very hard to listen through translation. Anybody who's done this knows you need more concentration. So the great part is the Committee of Experts room is very close to the coffee bar at the ILO. Uh, the other thing I would say is the reliance we put on the staff privately. Uh, say this to you. Even if we're supposed to be experts, we could not do it without the staff, the permanent staff of the ILO. Uh, their knowledge base is incredible, and the commitment also. I can't. I can't emphasize how difficult it is to work in a truly international organization. It's not a corporation. You just can't order governments or anyone to do anything. Uh, people of different nationalities and cultures interact very differently. As you would know, some will say something directly to your face, and others wouldn't ever say it directly to your face. Um, the staff people at the ILO have truly punishing travel schedules, and unlike corporate executives, they are not staying at luxury hotels, and frequently they're going to very poor countries where third world countries uh, conditions prevail. I know, I can't tell you, more than one staff person would say, oh, we're lucky. The WHO is just up the street, which it is. It's only about 600 feet up the road. And we can pop over and get our <laughs> vaccines, our injections, and, and get the information we need as we're going to some place with malaria and contaminated water, et cetera. They do that all the time. Coming from a university where 18-year-olds sometimes now call professors by their first name, I'm quite startled by getting emails that say, hi, Janice, uh, <laughs> freshman. <laughs> yeah. OK, you know. Uh, you know, I was almost taken aback by the formality of the ILO at first. Uh, in French, I was Madame, by the way, those of you who know French will be interested in this, Madame Le Professeur, Alexpier. Um, and uh, even at the, going to the coffee bar, it would, they'd say to the barista, like, Madame le professeur and l'expert, you know, voudrait un café. <laughs> you know, it was, but it was a real mark of respect that within the house, the committee of experts is held with respect. And by the way, speaking of respect, some of my colleagues were surprised that the American mission didn't have a car pick me up in the morning like several other missions do, <laughs> I think, which is sort of funny. The Committee of Experts, almost unknown in the United States, in some countries, is so highly respected. I have been introduced to groups. There is almost an audible um, s expression of awe. Like, oh, the you know, Committee of Experts. 
I mean, it's just, it seems unreal, but to, and I'll mention, to people in Poland, who remember that it's the Committee of Experts who condemned the imposition of martial law when solidarity uh, was demonstrating. To people in Chile, who remember the observation of the Committee of Experts when the right-wing government overthrew Allende and killed trade unionists. To the people of South Africa, who remember the Committee of Experts upholding their rights during the apartheid period. By the way, to the employers in uh, Belarus, who see that the Committee of Experts right now is upholding their rights to their freedom uh, to associate with each other and basically not have the government run them. To these groups, the integrity of the Committee of Experts is unquestioned. And I'll give you one more. I know I'm running over, but I'll beg some indulgence here. Uh, in the late 1990s, a case that came before us, and you, you may have heard, you know this incident. It's the Japanese comfort woman. Remember during World War II when Japan um, invaded certain countries like China, Singapore, Korea, they sometimes uh, compelled enslaved local women to perform, sex to be basically sexually assaulted and raped to service the soldiers. And um, you know, it was kept quiet for a long time, it was very shameful to people, etc. But in the 90s, it's almost the daughters of these people sort of brought it forward, partly because people get old and, and, and I think in their last years they want some vindication. So when this happened, they began to campaign uh, that these victims should be recognized and perhaps you know, some compensation or something done. Uh, but the Japanese government would do nothing. Uh, the position they took was that the treaty ending World War II had settled all claims and that was it. So they tried various bodies and nothing happened. And finally, I don't say finally, but they came to the ILO and presented this claim. Now, what may surprise you is that Japan was a signatory to convention number 29 and had never revoked its uh, ratification. So it was in effect all throughout the war years. And the conventions actually don't have deadlines. You know, there's no statute of limitations. And there's a big debate on the committee about whether we should take this uh, 50 years afterwards just for that reason. But it was decided to take the case because sexual assault and rape definitely violates convention number 29. And they issued an observation saying this uh, and saying that the government should consider some means of recognizing uh, the wrong that had occurred. This observation was very widely publicized in Asia. You can imagine like in China and Korea that it was publicized and in Japan. And the uh, groups that had campaigned basically said finally an authoritative body has declared that Japan had violated th these women's human dignity. With the Committee of Experts actually got letters from people um, saying this and including young Japanese who said that they did not know what their country had done. So when people ask, what do we do? I, I mentioned some people read uh, what we write and it can have an effect. Now, how do we write it? I mentioned the word observations. Well, these are difficult to read. <laughs> they're about now 2,500 a year. Luckily, they're online and luckily now you can sort by country and by convention. And an observation is considered generally, depends on the convention, more serious. A direct request is a nice way of saying, well, we're asking you questions. What we're saying, implying by those questions, is can be quite different things. It's a very uh, dry and diplomatic language. It's gotten better, but I think for Americans it might strike you as softer than you might expect. But the use of language, there's gradations, and people who read it understand. When you say a government acts with impunity, it means that they're being totally outrageous. That's almost unbelievable what they're doing. So you get used to the language being used. The Committee of Experts does not tell a government directly what to do. It says, here's the convention, here's how you're not complying. But it, has, it doesn't say go enact a statute or go do X. Uh, firstly, the situation in countries varies greatly. Of course, the legal system varies, the resources at the government, government's command varies, the reliability of data, and even the ability to do things, such as to undertake labor inspection, all have to be considered. Uh, but the Committee of Experts is looking for is movement in the right direction, step by step. That's what it's trying to push. So sometimes you might read one and you say, well, this country is terrible, and yet they only seem to be asking for a little bit. Well, it's trying to get the next step taken. Whereas a country that's done nearly everything, it might be pointing out the one or two things they haven't done. So you really can't read it like a 
can't line up countries as if the length of the observation or the number of things mentioned is some sort of report card. It's not. You have to read uh, for one country the last five things the Committee of Experts has said to, to see what you're getting. By the way, the Committee of Experts may, ask, may suggest technical assistance. It might say we draw the government's attention to the availability of technical assistance. This is a nice way of saying to the government, it might be prodding them, like, if you don't do something, we're going to try to send people in. <laughs> Maybe you'll do something then. But it actually often may be, um, you probably need help, and there are services available. As George will tell you, only if the budget is there. But, but really, the, the ILO does a tremendous amount of assistance to countries that is often behind the scenes. Like if you say who wrote the statute, in some countries it's essentially the ILO because the country doesn't actually have the capacity, the legal talent to write the statute. Um, one other thing, a couple of things about the reporting. Under the uh, Article 22, which is when a government has ratified a convention, it's obliged to report to the Committee of Experts. It is asked to mention court decisions that involve questions of, of principles related to the convention. So that's how we find out when courts are um, applying a convention, maybe they have a question how they have interpreted freedom of association, for instance, in the Canada, Canada's uh, case, the British Columbia Health Services case, or lots of things in Australia on that. Um, we also see whether in a country a convention is considered self-executing uh, or whether, and that sometimes does depend on the convention's wording um, and also on the legal and political situation in a country or whether statutes have to be enacted. Sometimes, it depends on the country, you'll, you'll find that a royal decree would be sufficient and then they'll just issue a royal decree if it's that type of country. I'll give you one example, though, of one that really fascinated me because I've written many years ago in equal pay, That's something you would never see in the United States. Uh, Japan ratified Convention 100, equal remuneration, and which the United States, of course, has not ratified. But um, the national law, they had passed a statute that involved gender equality, and it did relate to pay, but it did not expressly say equal pay for work of equal value. And the case that came before the Tokyo District Court, which is a low-level court, uh, was about relative value. It was clear the women weren't doing exactly the same as the men, but the, the wage gap was extraordinary, so they should have been paid more. And so the, uh, this was in 2001, the Tokyo District Court looked at this and said, well, Japan has ratified Convention 100. Convention 100 says equal pay for work of equal value. Um, that's the way I should interpret this, the Japanese statute, and uh, these women um, have a claim, essentially. This could not happen in the United States, but it'll show you um, it could, it happened in Japan. No, about a page. So I'm, I'm actually on my list, but yeah, one page. Um, you know the general survey? Um, if you're interested in a topic, please look at general surveys. I'll have to tell you something. Go to the ILO. General, the, there's two things the Committee of Experts does. It does um, its, its review of the government's reports and the general survey each year, and they always report 3A and 3B, and the 3 is in Roman numerals. That's the easiest way to find it. So if you're interested in freedom of association, the last general report general survey was 1994. That's what you're looking for. It gives you the interpretations in a nice way. I was going to go and I mentioned the, there's the conference committee on the application of standards, which is where the government, well, employers and workers get in. I'll skip that. But I do want to mention committee on freedom of association. I think there's a lot of misunderstanding about this. And I just read on the SSRN network last week an article by Brian Langill that really annoyed me, to be blunt. Um, about the ILO. <laughs> if any of you saw it, you'll know why. But he mentions almost only the C Committee of Freedom of Association. What happened was, in 19, uh, after World War II, uh, Convention 87 was adopted on Freedom of Association and Convention 98 the next year. A lot of conventions were adopted fast. In 19, so what happened is, if you have a country that is suppressing freedom of association, what happens if the country hasn't ratified? Because they never have to file a report with the Committee of Experts. So the workers' representatives were so frustrated by this that they, and they had enough support in the, in the conference that they created a new mechanism called the Committee on Freedom of Association to deal with 
complaints relating to freedom of association. Now, the Committee of Freedom of Association, they're not independent experts. The members of the Committee of Association are from the governing body. Um, and therefore, it's tripartite. Three employers' representatives, three workers' representatives, three government representatives, and there is a neutral chair who's usually a professor. Um, and when I say a complaint, it's individual cases. So it's not that the United States has violated Convention 87. It's that uh, the case that you had there, Bosch, it's subsidiary. A company has violated Convention 87. And that the Committee on Freedom of Association deals with the facts of that case and says this is how the principles of 87 apply to those facts. Um, the reason why I mentioned is there's a lot about the Committee on Freedom of Association making law. Um, I can only say that it's not creating a new body of jurisprudence on freedom of association. And in all my time, and I've talked to people at NORM, there's never been any significant deviation between what the Committee of Experts says and the Committee of Freedom of Association says. There isn't, and I, I could tell you some reason why, but it's partly because the staff ensure that the two are aligned in a sense and that the expert knows what's you know the case and that almost the expert is giving a view privately a little bit early so we don't have these differences um, and I just want to say that so you'll see the cases individual cases involving companies but the general jurisprudence is found when you look under Convention 87. So they're both very important, as I say, but I think there's some misunderstanding as if the Committee of Experts doesn't deal with freedom of associations as it does. So I will stop because I've run way over and you could talk for hours about the ILO, but my final comment would be about, which I can't get to decent work, I'd only say that proclaiming rights is not sufficient and even deciding whether a country has complied or not is not sufficient. And that's why the decent work campaign, which is a label, decent work, is so important because to have rights applied, to have them realized, conditions must exist for workers to be able to enjoy the rights guaranteed them in the various conventions. So looking at this quest for social justice, the answer is rights have to be married with action. Thanks. Committee is called the Conference Committee on the Application of Standards, which once again is tripartite. Um, and they consider various issues, including the experts' report and the general survey. But something very important happens. The Conference Committee uh, decides to select from like 2,500 reports uh, about 25 cases where they ask the government uh, to come before the committee and explain what's going on. And so they pick very, what they consider very serious uh, violations. Often it would be uh, 
freedom of association, child labor, forced labor are the most uh, common. Now and then you see other conventions. It's really hard to pick the 25, so they have to negotiate that. And then they write their own report, they have their own discussions, but the importance of it is, um, is in a sense the conference committee, being tripartite, is giving its views on how the um, experts have viewed cases, and also what they see as the issues coming out of the convention, uh, out of the conventions and the reports. Now, the Article 26 is is that. Oh, that, yeah. Yes. You know, I, um, you mean lead, leading to commission of inquiry or something? Yeah, well. In, um, in really, really serious instances, like Guatemala would be an example, um, where the normal supervisory mechanisms, and actually the conference committee is part of that, and, uh, where, uh, where the situation has gotten extremely serious and where there does not seem to be any improvement, another step is uh, often, it may be warranted, and the, under our, as you mentioned, 24 and 26, there are ways that a nation or a workers group can ask for something more to be done, and the one I'm familiar with is the commission of inquiry, like when they did it, uh, one was in Myanmar, for instance, and when they do that, what happens is they actually do uh, hearings and fact-finding, and so uh, if possible, they go to the country involved, if the country involved will let the commission of inquiry in, and they usually send two or three members of the committee of experts they're often based on language. Do you speak the language of the people and a few staff people? But it's hearings, actually hearing what people have to say and making a report to the conference on what can be done. With you followed Myanmar over a long period of time, you'll see, they weren't always commissioned, there were various things. Myanmar is a very special case. Uh, Francois, Francis, I always have to say Francois, Francis Maupin has written about that. Well, you know, um, it may be, you know, over time, sometimes openings at particular times come up, come up. so that m may happen in that case. You, there's periods where you get no reports from a country for 20 years, and then there's a change, and then suddenly you start getting reports again. So mm -hmm. at the ILO, part of the thing is always trying to keep the door open, even if they're, if I could put it, in a low level of compliance. Thank you so much.
I think we're about ready to start, so if you want. There is a reception immediately following this panel, so the sooner we begin, the sooner the reception starts. Uh, it'll be right outside in the, uh, in the atrium. My name is John Higgins. I'm on the faculty here at uh, Catholic University. I'm uh, and a retired, from the national, retired attorney from the National Labor Relations Board. Welcome to our panel on freedom of association. As you know, the Convention on a Freedom of Association and Protection of the Right to Organize is one of the eight conventions that are termed core labor standards by the ILO. And this convention is one of the two of the eight that relates directly to our subject this afternoon. The Freedom of Associa Association Convention, also known as Convention Number 87, was adopted by the ILO, as Janice said, a few moments ago by the ILO in 1948. A year later, the ILO adopted the Convention 98, the right to organize and the collective and collective bargaining convention. Neither Convention 87 nor Convention 98 has as yet been ratified by the United States. Now, in addition to these core labor standard conventions, the ILO adopted a declaration of fundamental principles and rights at work in 1998. And one of the key principles of this declaration is, and I quote, freedom of association and effective recognition of the right to collective bargaining. The core labor standard conventions and the declaration contain principles that are really at the heart of the constitution of the ILO. And so whether it has ratified them or not, the United States, as a member of the ILO, is obligated to respect the values that lie behind that ILO constitution. Now, the primary vehicle for protecting and honoring freedom of association and principles in the private sector of the American workplace is, of course, the National Labor Relations Act. There are differences between Conventions 87, 98, the Declaration, and the National Labor Relations Act. And one of those differences is, of course, coverage. The NLRA does not cover the public sector of the American workplace. Nonetheless, the Act has set a standard that has prompted many states to fashion their legislation for public sector labor relations along the lines of the National Labor Relations Act. Some states, however, regrettably, have little, if any, protections at all. Section 1 of the NLRA declares the policy of the United States to be one, and I quote, of encouraging the practice and procedure of collective bargaining and protecting the exercise by workers of full freedom of association 
self-organization, designation of representatives of their own choosing for the purpose of negotiating the terms and conditions of their employment or other mutual aid and protection, close quote. Convention 97, excuse me, 87, 98, and the Declaration are somewhat broader than the NLRA. They advocate positions that extend beyond those followed by the board and the courts in, in their interpretation of this country's national labor statute. Some of the differences between these standards and the NLRA would require statutory changes in order to conform them to each other. But there are other differences where the board and the courts have the authority to at least consider ILO principles and customary international law in fashioning national labor policy. And the question for us today is should they? Now if the answer to that question is yes, one asks which aspects of American workplace law would benefit most from consideration of international standards? And how should these standards be presented to the board and to the courts? Is this a responsibility of the parties or should the board and the courts be looking to international standards sua sponte? We have an excellent panel to consider these issues. Uh, you, uh, you all have the program. You know their uh, biographical uh, information. I'm not going to spend any time introducing them, but let me just identify them. Lance Kompa from Cornell, professor at Cornell. Stefan Makulowicz, who is a, a partner at the Little Law Firm, management law firm. And Judy Scott, who is, of course, the general counsel for the SEIU. Each of our panelists will speak for about 15 minutes and then each will have five minutes for any additional comments they want to make. At that point then, the floor will be open to you and you'll have an opportunity to question the panel. So with that, I turn the program over to Lance Kampa. Thanks, John, and uh, thanks to Nancy and the ILO Washington office and to Catholic University Law School for uh, organizing this important forum. Um, I've already learned a lot. Um, I expect to learn a lot more from my co-panelists. I hope I can make a, at least a minimal contribution to the discussion. Um, I'm going to try to you know, work through my presentation fairly uh, uh, expeditiously because I do hope that there's plenty of time for uh, questions, and not just questions to the panel, but also comments because uh, you know, I feel like I won the lottery in some respect by being invited to speak here because I, I could throw a dart and anybody I hit could just as well be uh, on, on one of the panelists. There's so much expertise in this room, so we should try to uh, try to exploit that. I, I think um, I, I was invited on the basis, uh, in part at least, of a, on a, of a re report that I wrote uh, last year for Human Rights Watch. Actually, it was at the end of uh, 2010, a report on European companies in the United States and ways in which, according to our analysis and report, that European companies who proclaimed loudly and publicly their um, devotion to core labor standards, to ILO uh, core, core conventions, to the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, to the pr uh, principles of the UN Global Compact, and on and on, all sorts of international instruments. Um, but when they when it, and in fact, they by and large live up to those commitments in their operations at home and in their dealings with uh, employees and uh, trade unions at home and even in other countries around the world. But when they come to the United States, they adopt American management style anti-union strategies and tactics. That's about as neutrally as I can put it. The union, trade unionists would call it union busting. Um, Managers would call it, uh, well, we just give people the facts about the downside of unionism and they have every right to know these facts which the unions will not tell them, so um, that's just an exercise of free speech. And you know, that, the argument goes back and forth that way. But in any event, these European companies, you go on their websites and you see how much they love the ILO core labor standards, uh, and yet when you examine their practices here in the United States, you see a disconnect between what they say and what they do. That's why the report is titled A Strange Case, um, because it's drawn from the complete title of the Robert Louis Stevenson story, The Strange Case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Um, now, I, I know that uh, arguably international labor standards and international law generally applies to states 
to governments uh, and not to private parties such as corporations. Um, I, I think that's the classical rule. I think that rule is at least in the process of breaking down somewhat. I mean, I think the case can be made that no, uh, actually, international human rights uh, responsibilities do attach to corporations. In the case of the European companies, though, it was, it was easy because they, they say, they proclaim that they adhere to these international standards and they, uh, um, you know, not only the ILO core labor standards, but the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the relevant international covenants and so on and so forth. Um, I actually thought this morning that we should find a company with headquarters in Maryland to bring a case in Judge Massidi's court um, <laughs> arguing that this is an implicit contract that they have made and if they're not living up to it, uh, maybe we should bring a breach of contract case and not file an unfair labor practice charge at the National Labor Relations Board. Maybe we'll get there. Um, but in any event, I don't want to dwell on the European uh, company angle because that's available, it, it's online at Human Rights Watch. Um, I, I do want to go to the underlying issues that, that are reflected in that report. Um, one, in what way, if any, we're all lawyers so we have to throw if any into the uh, discourse at some point. In what way, if any, uh, does U.S. labor law run afoul of international labor standards? Uh, and the second issue would be, so what? You know, what, what does it mean? If, if the answer to that is yes, so what? And let me you know, try to work quickly through uh, uh, an analysis of these. The first issue arises in uh, two ways, I think. Uh, one is where the National Labor Relations Act is clearly contrary to international labor standards. And I'm talking specifically now about conventions 87 and 98 related to freedom of association, because the, those, the freedom of association is in fact the subject matter of the National Labor Relations Act. Um, I, I don't want to go through everything. I think there are several ways in which the uh, um, U.S. the NLRA is contrary to conventions 87 and 98. In fact, um, Ed Potter, who is the dean of the management side analyst of these issues, uh, in his 1984 book specified 12 separate provisions of the National Labor Relations Act that are in conflict with conventions 87 and 98. Uh, one of them, obviously, is the exclusions clause. Agricultural workers excluded from coverage of the National Labor Relations Act. A farm worker who tries to form a union can be fired by the employer with complete impunity. There's no labor board to go to. There's no unfair labor, unfair labor practice charge to file. In some states, there are, there are state level uh, labor boards that will handle uh, agricultural workers' issues, but not the, uh, not the uh, uh, federal statute. Um, low level supervisors. This is another area where the uh, ILO, the relevant ILO convention, and the, uh, uh, as elaborated by the Committee on Freedom of Association and the Committee of Experts where uh, uh, countries have ratified. In general, low-level supervisors are allowed to collectively bargain. Uh, in, they usually cannot be in the same bargaining unit with people that they supervise, but they are seen to have those rights. And you know, those of you who, who, who know, remember that um, it, the Wagner Act actually allowed frontline supervisors in the United States to have unions and bargain collectively. And in fact, I don't know if it got to a million, but there were hundreds of thousands of workers in the United States who were frontline supervisors, usually called foremen. There were probably four women too, especially during the war years. Um, but they had unions and they bargained collectively and the economy didn't crumble. Um, but management in the counteroffensive to the Wagner Act in 1947 in the Taft-Hartley Act uh, put supervise, low, low, you know, any, any level of supervision um, into, the, uh, into the excluded category. Um, I think the case can be made, and in fact, Ed Potter made it, I don't have to make it, that Section 8C of the Act, the so-called Employer Free Speech Act, authorizes interference with workers' attempts to organize a union, as long as it's not coercive interference. Uh, but certainly, uh, management is free to compel workers to attend meetings um, under pain of discipline if they don't. And management can tell people to shut up, don't talk, under pain of discipline if they don't shut up or try to talk. And tell them the union is a bunch of liars and thieves, and if you go on strike, I can permanently replace you. Um, and sure, if you come in, I'll have to bargain and maybe things will stay the same. Maybe you'll get a little more. 
or maybe you'll lose everything you have. You know, this kind of hammering away uh, uh, at the, uh, and, and exploiting the power relationship between uh, management and the employees to, to, to drive home this idea that uh, uni uh, union organization is going to bring uh, very dire consequences. The, uh, the very harsh restriction on secondary boycotts, uh, an almost absolute restriction in the United States. Um, and by the way, I, when I, I mentioned that these are contrary, it's not just me saying it. The ILO Committee on Freedom of Association has, in relevant cases, uh, expressed the view that U.S. labor law is not in compliance with the, uh, with the uh, conventions. The, uh, we have an almost absolute prohibition on secondary activity, secondary boycotts, as the term has come to be seen. Trade unionists see it as solidarity action uh, between workers trying to support each other in their struggles. Um, the, the, the ILO, it didn't arise in a U.S. case, it arose in a U.K. case after the Thatcher government adopted a U.S.-style prohibition on secondary boycotts. In general, the, uh, the ILO standard and the standard around the world uh, in most countries is uh, some analysis of proportionality in the, in the uh, instance of secondary activity. So if a big, strong union is crushing a small, weak employer, um, it's okay for the authorities to step in and put a stop to that kind of secondary activity. If a big, strong union is taking action against a big, strong employer, secondary action in support of a primary dispute, well, the, the employer is big and strong, he can defend himself. That, that kind of pr proportionality enters into it. In the United States, it doesn't matter. Um, any form of secondary activity is strictly uh, prohibited. I'll, I'll leave aside the whole question of public employees because we're mainly looking at the National Labor Relations Act for purposes of this discussion. Um, but the widespread denial of collective bargaining rights to public employees in states around the country is another clear area where U.S. law is contrary to international standards. Now, the second way it arises is where the language of the statute is, in fact, consistent with uh, the language of the conventions or the spirit of the conventions or the purpose of the conventions, but where board and court decisions, and I have to say in the long run it's mainly court decisions, have pushed U.S. law away from uh, compliance with the international standards. Um, one is just in the area of de delays, just the delays in the process. Uh, you know, everybody knows the reality of what happens when uh, workers get fired for union organizing. For many uh, employers, it's just it's a strategic decision. Um, knowing that it's wrong, fire the employees to, to kill the organizing drive and let the, uh, if the employer wants to just dig in, let two or three or four years go by before there's some final order to reinstate the employee. And by that time, most people, most victims have moved on to other places of work. They're not going to come back. What actually happens in most cases, of course, is there's a settlement and the employer pays 2000 or $3,000. The employee goes away. And in the meantime, the organizing drive is crushed. That's, that's typical, absolutely typical. Um, it's illegal to fire people. The law is very clear because of union activity. But in practice, the delays that are available to employees, I mean, there is a solution with the use of the 10-J injunction, but that is so rare that, that it, it's not enough to overcome this general uh, pattern. Striker replacement, permanent striker replacement. Not in the statute. It came about in dicta in the McKay radio case, as you know, all the labor law experts in the room know. Um, it wasn't even the issue. A lot of people you know, who only vaguely know don't realize that the, the union actually won the case in McKay radio because it involved the discriminatory treatment of people returning from strike. But in the course of making that decision, the Supreme Court unnecessarily, the issue wasn't really briefed or, or fully discussed, just unnecessarily added that, oh yeah, employers can permanently replace uh, people who exercise their right to strike over economic uh, uh, terms and conditions. Uh, the, the ILO did, con the Committee on Freedom of Association did consider this case and found that it is contrary to uh, the, the Convention 87 on Freedom of Association. It said it in very elliptical language, as uh, Janice Balacci said, the language is very diplomatic and they don't call each other, you know, they don't name names and so on, but if you, you know, if you read it, it's pretty clear they're saying this is not acceptable under Convention 87. Uh, access issues. The, uh, the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association has elaborated in several cases the notion that uh, 
um, workers should be able to hear from union representatives in the workplace um, about whether to form unions or not, or what unions might be able to contribute uh, to the workplace. And obviously it should be done in ways that do not interfere with uh, production or work or so on. The, the gen our general rule of non-work area, non-work time, which only is available to employees uh, under the ILO approach would also apply to uh, non-employee non uh, union representatives. That is absolutely out of the question in the United States based on court decisions that say property rights are superior to freedom of association rights. Um, so, so that's another area where uh, the, uh, um, the, the uh, court decisions have pushed, pushed U.S. law away from uh, ILO conditions. Um, what does it get us? We have these, uh, we can identify a gap between U.S. labor law and international standards. We have um, language that can be uh, extracted from decisions of an authoritative international body of the, about the ways in which U.S. law is out of compliance with international standards. Um, it, it gets us this, I think. First of all, it gets us uh, traction on the soft law track that uh, people that has already been raised. But this idea that um, there is an authoritative body that can identify ways in which U.S. labor law and practice falls short of international standards. Uh, that's really a, a valuable tool for um, uh, just, you know, for one thing, the naming and shaming uh, um, a type of activity that unions and NGOs and civil society try to uh, uh, undertake to bring pressure to bear on corporations. It's important for the, the code of conduct phenomenon. So many codes of conduct now have incorporated ILO core labor standards and ILO conventions that uh, and, and some American companies have done this too, or European companies operating in the United States. It's another way to, uh, to, to get a handle on that and to press for compliance with the international norms, um, even if uh, U.S. law does not require that level of compliance. Um, the, uh, the whole socially responsible investment phenomenon, uh, which hasn't been mentioned, it's kind of been implicit because it's, it's implicit when you start talking about corporate social responsibility, but there's also a socially responsible investment side of this, and a lot of socially responsible investors, um, more in Europe, but more and more in the United States as well, are starting to look at the question of um, are companies uh, adhering to international labor standards in their operations, and that's going to affect our investment decisions. Um, it's also a factor in a, a whole private side phenomenon that has developed in recent years of, of uh, global framework agreements or international framework agreements. I think Judy Scott is going to talk about that, but where uh, international unions and multinational companies are actually nego negotiating agreements that incorporate ILO core labor standards and the rules of the conventions 87 and 98, and they also create a pri uh, an arbitration system to resolve disputes. Uh, that arise under these agreements. So there's a lot of exciting ways and, and novel ways in which uh, um, international labor standards are being uh, brought to bear in the U.S. Uh, labor law context. Um, I think we've gotten that far with the, the notion of incorporating international labor standards into U.S. labor law discourse. Um, I, we're, we're not at the track yet, at the point yet, where um, the labor board and the courts are uh, normally taking these sorts of things into account. I think that's the next challenge. It's really the central focus of this uh, uh, conference, and I you know, hope that we'll have more discussion about that. Um, I think that, uh, I, I actually think it's mainly the responsibility of the labor bar to start pushing international labor standards questions before the NLRB and before the courts. And even before that, I think it's the responsibility of the labor law professoriate to teach our students about international labor law and international labor standards. And more and more, this is being done. We really have to change the climate, shift the climate, um, put international labor standards more and more into the discourse of our labor law debates so that it becomes normal to talk about international labor standards and how they may or may not apply in the United States. And that will really create a foundation for moving forward to, toward uh, specific incorporation of international labor standards into the decision-making process of the NLRB uh, and the courts.
Again, as uh, Judge Massidi uh, indicated earlier, uh, this, not in terms of binding precedent. You know, we still have to ground it in U.S. law. But there's plenty of scope for international labor law to serve as an informing uh, um, uh, uh, device, a, a, a inspiring device, and, and so on to, uh, to, to widen our horizons on this issue. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Lance. You know, for 47 years I worked for the National Labor Relations Board. I thought we were the good guys. I'm not sure we were that great. <laughs> anyway, um, our next speaker is Stefan Markulowitz. Thank you, uh, John. Um, and thank you, Lance and uh, Judy. Uh, this is really an honor to be on this panel of uh, uh, real thought leaders in this area. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that we're on opposite sides of the table, I respect our positions. Um, and respect them immensely on this. And John Higgins, just for those of you who don't know, was a professor of mine at Catholic Law years ago and taught me not labor law, but local government law. And he's the reason I'm a labor lawyer. So here we go. <laughs> the other thing that I think is kind of interesting is that uh, Judge Massetti was the uh, first judge before whom I had any oral argument. And uh, um, he, he, he treated me fairly in the, in the case. So it was great. It was a, uh, so anyway, it's great to be here. Uh, I am going to talk a little bit, it's kind of interesting, I had all these great prepared remarks and everybody has covered just about everything I was going to say. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I have to sort of work a little bit around that. So if you hear some of the same stuff, uh, I apologize for that. Um, the first thing I want to talk a little bit about uh, is, the, um, is to highlight in response to Lance, uh, Lance's uh, discussion about the strange case. Um, the article that he prepared uh, in connection with these uh, 10 European multinationals describing that. Uh, there was an international organization of employers rebuttal for which I was a technical expert or uh, consultant in connection with uh, the preparation of that as well as the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the U.S. Council for International Business. Uh, in which uh, the employer community uh, internationally responded to this particular issue and many of the arguments that were set forth, uh, most notably the issue related to freedom of expression and opinion uh, in the context of uh, international labor standards as they apply in the United States, as they apply under uh, US, uh, U.S. labor law and Section 8C. And I think this is one of the areas, I think Lance pointed out a whole host of areas where Ed Potter, who is one of my mentors in this area, uh, has pointed out that the National Labor Relations Act, in fact, does not conform to conventions 87 or 98 in their specific notion. But with respect to Section 8C, actually there is a very uh, clear line of precedent, I won't say precedent, but a clear line of thinking with respect to how international labor standards apply to freedom of expression and opinion. Because without freedom of expression and opinion, there would be no conference of this nature here today. In the context of, 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 of the free, a free trade union movement, regardless of where it is, if you can't express your opinion about forming, joining, and assisting a labor organization, then that, that doesn't exist. But you know what's good for the goose is good for the gander. And employers can also express their opinion. And in a recent case that uh, came out a couple of years ago involving a major uh, U.S. employer uh, out of the Committee on Freedom of Association and with some subsequent correspondence from the uh, ILO's office and the um, International Labor Standards Office out of the ILO, Karen, actually Karen Curtis's office, uh, the, there was a pretty clear-cut statement that Freedom of expression and opinion is available to employers, provided they don't interfere with the rights of workers to form and join and form labor unions. Well, what does that mean? In the United States, under the National Labor Relations Act, we have an extremely comprehensive body of law that defines what interference is. Okay, it may not be exactly what certain people want. It may include captive audience meetings. It may include a whole host of other issues. Okay, but it is defined, and it is defined consistent with our, our legal, cultural traditions, historical traditions, whatever. If the law wants to change, if, the, if, if people want to change the law, they have the ability to do that, but they have to do it through Congress. So I'm going to talk a little bit. So that's, that's one of the key points that, that, that was raised in the, uh, in the IOE rebuttal that I think is important to point out as a significant uh, consistency, in fact, with respect to uh, U.S. law and international labor standards. But really what I want to talk about here today is to sort of get more into the details about application of international labor standards to U.S. law by the judiciary or by whomever, okay, the National Labor Relations Board or the legislature or whomever. And 
There's, I think, one key issue that needs to be clearly understood. International labor standards is an extremely broad concept. It means many things to many different people, okay? International labor standards could include ILO conventions, ILO recommendations, ILO uh, resolutions, the 98 Declaration on Fundamental Principles and Rights at Work, the OECD Guidelines for Multinational Enterprises, the, the, or, the, the, the uh, United Nations Global Com Compact, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so what I want to do, if we're going to talk about whether the judiciary should consider application of international labor standards in a domestic context, I think we need to understand what those are. Okay, because there's a very precise definition as it relates to the United States or as it relates to, the, to, 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 to governments. And that is an ILO convention. Okay, a government adopts or ratifies an ILO convention. And the United States, as we've heard several times today, has not ratified conventions 87 or 98, both relating to collective bargaining, freedom of association and collective bargaining. The process for doing that is called, and we have a process for it, and in fact it's ongoing right now, or it has been ongoing right now with respect to one ILO convention, which I'll talk about in a second. But basically, the process is, you take the convention, and there's a group called the Tripartite Advisory Panel on International Labor Standards, otherwise known as TAPLS, because this is a world of acronyms and you need a dictionary to uh, uh, to understand what they all mean. But TAPLS will then, which can sit, it's a tripartite, method, tripartite body, consists of the president of the AFL-CIO, the president of the USCIB, and the Secretary of Labor, or their designees. And the TAPLS group meets, and the TAPLS group decides, or the, you know, their, their positions with respect to whether U.S. law in its current form conforms to the, principle, to, the, to, the, to the International Labor Convention, the ILO Convention, that is being considered. Okay? And recently, once that's done, then the administration has a sign-off on that. They can then present it to the Senate, and the Senate can ratify it, and then it becomes, I guess, the law of the land. And how that applies, I mean, some of the cases that were cited in the materials, some of the judges have said, well, that doesn't necessarily have the same treaty standard. It's, you know, I'm, it's beyond me. I'm not, a, I'm not an expert in those areas of whether it's a treaty or whether it's not a treaty, but I can tell you this, is that if it's not ratified, it doesn't apply to the United States, okay? If it's not ratified, it doesn't apply to the United States, okay? And so, Right now, Convention 111, which is the convention, one of the core conventions relating to discrimination, has in fact been signed off by TAPLS. And it's currently sitting in the State Department. I guess at some point it will make its way to the Senate. That's not the first time it's happened, it's happened before. And that was signed off by the employer community, okay? That deals with discrimination, that deals with, with, with that. So, I mean, it's not like we're not, you know, we're not, we're not, we're, we're opposed to international labor standards, et cetera, but anyway. Okay, so you have your, if you have uh, a ratified international labor convention that has been put into place, then you have mechanisms within the ILO to enforce them. Okay, we talked about them, and that's one of the reasons I had the question about Article 26 and Article 24 enforcement mechanisms, but you also have the Committee on Application of Standards and the Committee of Experts that, that, that reviews the reports that are done. So there's a, a monitoring mechanism that exists there. Okay. Um, in the context of freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining, Convention 87, we haven't ratified that. Those mechanisms don't exist. Okay? So I would submit to you that unless Congress, unless the Senate ratified Convention 87 or Convention 98, there is no legal authority for the courts to incorporate those into their jurisprudence because they're charged with interpreting the Constitution, interpreting the the, uh, the statutes that charge them with the responsibility, would charge them with, you know, set the law up, as well as precedent from the Supreme Court. So, for example, in the context of uh, strike or replacement, as uh, Lance was describing, that's one of the examples in which, uh, in, which, in which the courts are bound by the Supreme Court precedent. Hoffman Plastics is another perfect example. Here's a case where the Supreme Court sort of placed uh, our immigration laws over the rights to freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. That's a Supreme Court decision, okay? Unless the Supreme Court changes their decision or Congress passes a different law, it doesn't matter from a domestic perspective what, what we can do. That's what the law is. That's what we, I mean, that's what we're in a law, law school. That's what we, that's what our system, system is, is, is here for. So you've got to change the law. Okay, so if we're going to ratify, if we're going to hold the United States and the National Labor Relations Board and everybody else to 
the terms of Convention 87 and Convention 98, then I think we have a duty to change the law in order to do that. Okay, I'm on the far end of the spectrum, as was described by, by, the, by our uh, last speaker. Sorry, that's where I come from. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, sort of switching gears to the Committee on Freedom of Association, because I think um, it is a very misunderstood organization, I think, as was described earlier. Um, I also think it is, uh, it, it is given a little more credit than it deserves. Um, because it is not consist, does not consist of a committee of experts, as was pointed out. Uh, it consists of three members from the governing body who represent employers, three members from the governing body of the ILO that represent workers, and three members that represent governments, and then each of them have three alternates. Okay? Cases brought before the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association are supposed to be brought against the government, not against the employer or against anyone else, because it's related to advising, providing conclusions and recommendations to governments about how they can better further the principles of freedom of association. And when you have a country that hasn't ratified ILO standards, ILO conventions like the United States, then you, you, you cannot apply the conventions themselves to the United States, and frankly, they don't. They talk about, they have a whole body of precedent, they actually have this, this digest of decisions that sets forth all the principles, and I think Judy's going to talk a little bit about that, but there's stuff about access, there's stuff about freedom of expression and opinion, uh, there is stuff about minority unions having rights, there is a whole bunch of, 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 of material in there. I think when you look at applying, if you're a jurist, a judge, NLRB, or whomever, and you're looking at applying CFA decisions to uh, a domestic setting or a domestic uh, application of domestic law, you need to understand what a CFA case is all about. A CFA case is not a case where you have a, com it's not a case like we know of in civil litigation where you have a complaint, you have an answer, and then there's a whole opportunity for discovery, and then there's a trial where the tr uh, there's a trier of fact, there's credibility, there are determinations of analysis as it applies to the law, and there's even appeal rights. The CFA is a far more streamlined, simple process. There's a complaint that contains whatever the complainant wants to include, including the allegation that they failed to comply with the principles of freedom of association as the complainant contends that they are. There is a response, sometimes, by the government, because the thing is served on the government. It's not always served on the employer's group. Sometimes the government will serve it on the employer's group if the government is responsible enough to do that, but in some jurisdictions, it's not. it just doesn't do that. Okay, then you have a potential response. Sometimes the government responds. Sometimes the government says, "Ah, I'm not going to listen to those folks in Geneva. They don't know what they're talking about." I'm not talking about the United States. The U.S. typically responds to all complaints, but they, they, they see complaints from all over the world, including many cases that involve, you know, the murder of trade unionists and things that are far more. You know, I've had I've had when I've been dealing with CFA cases, dealing with members of the CFA, but representatives saying to me, you know. I understand the nuances of the National Labor Relations Act that you want to argue, but you know, I got three cases that deal with trade unions who've been murdered. What's more important? Okay? So, so the, 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 the issue is, is, that, is, that, is that the cases, you have the response, you have the complaint, you have the response, and then you have the process of deliberation. The office then creates a draft text and they negotiate it by consensus. They negotiate whatever the resolution is by consensus behind closed doors. It's not even a transparent process. You can't go in there. I've had multiple cases before the CFA. I can't go into the room. And I'm representing U.S. business in those cases, or some of those cases. Okay? It's not a transparent process. They come out with a negotiated solution, and then that goes into, that gets adopted by the governing body of the ILO, and that becomes international labor law. Well, if I'm a judge and I'm looking and I'm having somebody cite to me ILO Committee on Freedom of Association cases, okay, and I'm being say, okay, where's this come from? If I'm that judge and I understand the process, I say, wait a minute, you mean there was no evidence that was taken? There were no witnesses that were presented? There was no ability to see the deliberations and hear the negotiations? No, the parties actually to it, who were involved in the case weren't, op weren't there to, to present their positions in person? And the answer is no. 
So what's the value of the case? Yeah, they talk about principle. They talk about guidance. They talk about a lot of stuff. And frankly, from a, from, you know, there is, there is, I'm not saying that the CFA is not a relevant organization. I'm not saying the CFA doesn't say things that are important and further basic principles of freedom of association and the right to collective bargaining. But I'm saying that if you're going to look to apply those to U.S. law in our domestic setting, you need to be clear to the court and to the NLRB and to whomever else what these things stand for, because they are not cases as you and I understand them under our common law system. So that's the CFA. That's the, the, the ILO, my ILO discussion. I want to talk a little bit about soft law, because that's really where I think the issues arise a lot more. Okay. We've been talking sort of some of the discussion at the outset was about the hard law issue, application of laws, all the rest of that in, in, in you know, international labor law to U.S. domestic law. The real issue and the real area where you see this happening is soft law. Okay. What Lance, Lance's article did was it called out a whole bunch of companies for this Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde approach, double standard approach. Okay. It talked about... Um, applying companies saying they're going to do something, and that's very common. I do a lot of work with multinationals that have corporate codes of social responsibility, and they're trying to deal with these issues and trying to wrestle with these issues, okay, and are being asked to sign international framework agreements and all the rest of that stuff. And there's a real issue there about whether documents or, or you know, international labor standards and conventions that are then uh, are, are, are incorporated into these codes of conduct, incorporated into these codes of corporate social responsibility. There's a real question about whether, whether, whether the terms of those are applicable to the multinational that now has adopted them. And I think that's where a court is going to look at these issues as a matter of contract, as Judge Massetti said, as a matter of contract, or if there's an arbitration provision, then it's going to be thrown off to arbitration, and then the arbitrator is going to apply what the arbitrator applies as, as the arbitrator is directed to do, which is these international labor standards, and companies are going to find themselves bound by international labor standards, some of which don't even apply in the country in which they operate, the United States. So they're, you know, granted, it's murky. I haven't seen any cases. In fact, I was talking with one of the, one of the folks from the ILO uh, before, uh, before the presentation, and we were discussing a little bit about, about how, um, if there's any case where this has been applied, and I haven't really seen one myself. Uh, he pointed out one that, that, that may or may not, may or may not, uh, I haven't looked at it, so, so it may be, may, be, may be applicable. But the reality of it is, is that I think this is where you're going to see the evolution. You're going to see it in the soft law area. You're going to see it in the court of public opinion. You're not going to see it in the, in the courts of law necessarily. So I think that's, that's the soft law arena is where this stuff is really going to come out, come through a contract concept, through, 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 other attempts to apply corporate policies, you know, their, their supply chain management things, there's all the rest of that. So I think that's where you're going to see it. But uh, uh, with respect to actual application of international labor standards, uh, ILO conventions, and, 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 and the doctrine of the Committee on Freedom of Association, that's something that shouldn't apply in, the, in, the, in, in, in jurisprudence. Now, I will say one thing, because, um, because I think it is important Okay, as I talk about the CFA not, not you know, saying, you know, having, va having, having value, uh, it has a lot of value. Um, but it's there for use, I think, in the United States with the legislature. Okay, if you have a situation where a state is being condemned because they don't have, uh, uh, they don't authorize free, uh, collective bargaining and organizing to, to the state, then that's, that case, that Committee on Freedom of Association case, should be what is considered in the mix of policy determinations by the legislature when they're looking to enact a bill into law. Okay? Um, that's where the proper place for it is. So, for example, during the Employee Free Choice Act debate, I wrote a paper that said a couple of key components of the Employee Free Choice Act did not conform to Internet, the principles of international labor law, which is, recognize that, the principles of international labor law, because number one, a card check, free, the, 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 there, there's, there's ILO, CFA cases that say a, a, a secret ballot election conducted by the authorities is the, mo is, 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 is the most, is the preferred method of designating representative status. 
number one. And then the second one is, if you recall, the Employee Free Choice Act had a second component that spoke to interest arbitration for first contracts. And there is a lot of CFA uh, case law talking about, uh, talking about um, the concept of uh, interest arbitration as not being consistent with freedom of association. So, so, you know, that's there to advise the legislators, to give them guidance, to give them ideas, to give them thoughts, just like statistics and all the rest of the stuff that was thrown into that debate, okay? But ultimately, the debate is at the, the legislative level. I think one of our earlier speakers talked about the democratization of international labor law which means incorporating it into our legal system through a democratic process, not through a judicial, judicial decision or through some sort of outside imposition. And I think that, that holds true. And I think if the U.S. Congress wants to amend the, uh, the National Labor Relations Act or if the United States wants to amend its constitution to incorporate the, the language that was offered from Germany, uh, then that is that we have a process to do that. So thank you very much. Yes. Can I just ask, maybe Janice could just clarify the difference between the standard and the cases? Because that's pretty different. I'm not sure we really have the same thing. Explain how a standard is adopted versus the supervisory system. Would you well, want to? Because um, I, I, I was a little confusing. I would say that generally the standards at the ILO are the conventions and the recommendations. And then the conventions more. Inside the House, they put them in three categories. So there's the fundamental, the human rights conventions, the promotional conventions, and then standards, once again. You'd have to see how they line them up. I think you were using it, I think Stefan was using it more broadly to say, just generally when you hear people talk sometimes, and they use the word international labor standards, they're just sort of referring to everything, like OECD guidelines, and they're not using it as precisely as within the IOM. Yeah, I just, yeah, I wanted to add one other thing. The CFA, by the way, can hear uh, a case where the country involved has ratified the convention. Mm -hmm. but, but it's particularly, from the complaining party's point of view, particularly useful where the country has not ratified the convention. So in the case of the United States, because we have not ratified it, the Committee of Experts has never said anything about the United States. Uh, just, just a quick comment on the, on the international labor standards in that term. I mean, we're sitting in a room of people who are really steeped in this, and I'm really happy to be here because I think it's good to have a dialogue, notwithstanding the fact that we may disagree on the substance of, of the point, it's good to have a dialogue over the issue because I think that's where, uh, where this is. But we get it. We understand it, okay? When you have a statement or a public, some sort of press release from somebody that says XYZ company violates international labor standards, the common public hasn't a clue what that means, okay? And there is a very technical definition for, 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 for which, standards, which standards would apply to domestic law. So I, I say that because I think that's, that's important. And, I, you know, it's good to be in a room where we can actually discuss that distinction because, as, as we all know, at the ILO, words mean an awful lot. Uh, <laughs> so, um, so. The final speaker is Judy Scott, who is, of course, the General Counsel of the Service Employees International Union. Okay, good. Okay. Okay. Uh, wow. We've had a lot we have covered today, and uh, it's been very, very interesting and provocative. Um, I want to explain a little bit why SEIU has gotten involved in international affairs, because Traditionally, you think of industrial unions that have, have global operations worldwide as being one area where it would make sense for unions to be involved on the international level. But SEIU represents about 2.1 million workers in U.S., Canada, and Puerto Rico, and many of our members work in low-wage industries, um, very often for large multinational corporations in the area of cleaning, food services, and security. So, We've come to learn that because we often come in contact with multinational corporations or our workers and members work for contractors 
who are employed or under uh, license with multinationals, such as big real estate companies that have global holdings, that this is really an area we have to be involved in and have to be engaged. Um, also the fact, as, as Lance was pointing out, that we're up against a framework, um, no offense, uh, it's a, a framework of U.S. labor law for the private sector whose promises and uh, protections have been eaten away by many court decisions and amendments since the NLRA's original passage. I do take comfort by the fact that in the 2007 when the Employee Free Choice Act was being debated uh, and there, a report came out from a Congressional House Committee about what was at stake and why labor law had to be reformed that they, that essentially the committee report labeled the situation of our current labor laws as a situation of a quote, human rights crisis that was the leading cause of the disappearing middle class and growing income inequality. And the report pointed out that quote, the freedom to form or join a union and engage in collective bargaining is an internationally recognized human right in the United States. The freedom of association is enshrined in the First Amendment of the Bill of Rights. Now that is a congressional report which talks about the fact that the right to form unions and the right to join unions and the freedom of association is really embedded in our Constitution and our commitment to um, freedom of association. So given the challenges of this brave new world, unions have been exploring innovative ways to reinvigorate the basic fundamental, I should say ILO core fundamental conventions of the freedom of association, the right to join unions, engage in collective bargaining. And over the last decade, the SEIU has joined the ranks of a growing number of unions in the service and industrial sectors that recognize the vital need to integrate global union alliances, with global organizing campaigns and contract campaigns and international labor standards into the way we go about our day-to-day -day business of building a social and economic justice movement. So I believe these efforts are leading us down a path where U.S. courts will need to evaluate international norms reflected in these ILO course labor standards as part and parcel of a modern labor law docket. And I want to consider for a moment the International Global Framework Agreements, um, sometimes called IFAs, and domestic organizing agreements growing out of global campaigns. These are two different kinds of, of um, documents, um, but they are both reflective of dealing with multinationals. These are agreements negotiated between a multinational corporation and a union or a union global federation. They often set the rules for employer and union conduct during organizing campaigns. The first such IFA was negotiated in 1994 between a core of French Hotel Corporation and the IUF, a global union federation. The initial IFAs contained broad commitments, incorporating a pledge to abide by the ILO core labor standards. There are now over 100 such agreements in numerous industrial sectors. So this is really a growing phenomenon. And we've learned over time and through uh, experience of trying to enforce these earlier versions that they have suffered from a critical defect. Often these agreements have lacked specific constraints on employer conduct and mandates about it, and they've had no effective enforcement mechanisms. So today we have been pursuing global organizing agreements and IFAs that spell out specific items that reflect practical compliance with core ILO labor standards. And I think people talked about that earlier in the morning panel. What does it really mean to have the right to form and join a union at the workplace? So what we're talking about is things like union organizer access to the work site to talk with workers and control and employer tactics that we believe have a coercive effect on workers' freedom of association. By the way, as a side note, I, I believe that the next creative round of labor lawyers out there uh, will really address this question of what is supervisor, what is employer interference with workers' rights. I will not accept that the CFA has concluded in Delta case that you can literally have, and I don't believe this is what they said, that you can have a barrage of forced listening of an anti-union propaganda at an employee work, employee's work site where they are forced to listen day after day to a virulent anti-union campaign and conclude 
that that is um, justifiable under freedom of association, the right to freely form and join unions. Where so. Yes, yes. So um, I'm going to put that Delta case in a category of debating the balloting procedure, and where it still remains to be seen whether we can convince the CFA that this really cannot qualify a freedom of association um, in these kinds of campaigns. But um, for example, um, some of our, uh, our, as I mentioned, our organizing agreements spar supervisor one-on-one -on -one meetings with employees about unionization or limit captive audience speeches throughout the campaign. Some commit to employer neutrality or at least limit the ways in which the employer can campaign against unionization during paid work time when the employees are forced to listen. And we push for commitments with teeth. Our standard domestic organizing agreements now contain expedited arbitration. Now expedited arbitration we have found as really a key to effective, enfor to effective enforcement so that parties can readjust their conduct quickly, if so ordered by an arbitrator, before a campaign environment is tainted beyond repair. So in these situations, we actually have arbitrators on the phone, and they, could, they can conduct arbitrations within 24 hours of a complaint, hear the parties through the phone proceeding, and make rulings about whether they violate the order and then order, uh, violates the agreement, and then order a remedy. Most international frameworks, on the other hand, tend to be much more lax in this regard. As I mentioned earlier, they may require monitoring and joint labor management committees um, to, but, um, to promote dialogue to address disputes, but they frequently do not go beyond that. There are a few that have provided for stepped up enforcement procedures. For example, the UNI, which is a global union um, federation, has an agreement with Securitas, a Swedish-based security company with operations in multiple countries, including the U.S., which is enforceable in Swedish court. The UN, uh, the UNI ISS Global uh, Framework Agreement is another example. That is a Danish-based multinational that began as a security company and now offers clients what it calls facility services, such as cleaning and landscaping. This IFA contains a mediation and binding arbitration provision. So there is no reason why an arbitration matter that arose under this IFA couldn't end up in a U.S. court for enforcement like any other labor arbitration case. And finally, Lance's report on a strange case gives the account of G4S, now headquartered in the U.K., and the world's largest security company, and frankly, the largest employer in Africa. SEIU and its international union partners through UNI waged an extensive global campaign that highlighted the company's failure to abide by ILO standards in multiple countries. As Lance points out, G4S ultimately signed a global framework agreement with union access, and it also provides for arbitration as an option upon mutual agreement. Thousands of workers have been organized by SEIU in the wake of these IFAs and related arrangements that have flown, uh, that have uh, risen after them. As these type of agreements are on the rise, it is only a short time before U.S. courts will have to confront enforcement of an arbitration award that interprets them, um, such as a GFA, or an arbitration award that interprets whether a particular employer workplace practice complies with an ILO core labor standard that has been mentioned in the IFA. Indeed, international framework agreements should be enforceable under 301 of the Labor Management Relations Act, since they are contracts between a union and an employer. And there is an excellent um, 2010 law review article in the Columbia Human Rights Review that explains why by Sarah Coleman. A corporate social responsibility code that is unilaterally issued by a multinational presents a very different um, scenario, but one that's, I think, equally interesting with respect to enforcement options. Attempts at judicial enforcement of this type of code, that is one that the employer has unilaterally issued as um, as part of its policy, uh, corporate-wide policy, has been pursued in U.S. court, but so far without much success. The most prominent case is Doe v. Walmart stores. Now, in 1992, in the midst of bad publicity, Walmart developed its standards for suppliers. This CSR code of conduct was incorporated into a co its contract with foreign suppliers purported to require all suppliers to adhere to applicable laws through basic international labor standards. 
However, Walmart's abysmal record in enforcing its code led to litigation. A case was filed in the federal district court in California on behalf of workers in five different countries, including Bangladesh, Indonesia, who were working under sweatshop conditions in Walmart supplier factories. Among other claims, the workers sued for breach of contract as third-party beneficiaries to Walmart's code with its uh, global supplier chain. They maintain that their, Walmart's failure to enforce that agreement and use its economic leverage over the supplier factories to undertake adequate monitoring um, forced them into uh, dire straits and violations of uh, basic ILO core labor standards. Now, Walmart was successful in its motion to dismiss. Um, it denied any legal basis for according these workers third-party beneficiary status. And ultimately, it prevailed in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals on that basis. But it's interesting to look at the briefs that it filed in the district court as to some of its rationale for why this should not be true. And I'll, there's extensive quotes, and I really urge you to, take, or to read the brief itself. But one of the, one of the things they say is, quote, if the plaintiff's efforts to have this court rewrite the law in the manner they favor is successful, the end result would be a scenario where U.S. court system becomes an international clearinghouse for millions of foreign workers who are employed by thousands of foreign factories. This extraordinary result would likely bring the global economy to a screeching halt. Now, I think it's interesting from this morning's discussion about what did come to a screeching halt. This was written what, back in 2007, a year before the, the global economy did come to a screeching halt for f failure to regulate across the board many standards. And I think it is about time for this whole issue to be revisited. And I think we have an interesting situation we will see as we talked about technology developing and the fact of Arab Spring has occurred and the that workers and activists can communicate worldwide with each other. You look at what has happened with the debate over Apple. Now, Apple is, there's no way Apple is not going to end up with a very strong code of conduct for its supplier factories. And it is not going to be able to say like Walmart, gee, we promised this, but we had no intention of it actually being effective. Consumers are not going to tolerate that. And they are not going to tolerate uh, with a corporation that, with a consumer savvy public, to have uh, the shield that Walmart held, um, hid behind to say, well, we issued this, but frankly, we're not responsible for enforcing it. And so I think we're going to see as a result the question of whether consumers have reliance, some kind of detrimental reliance on these codes of kind of when they go to buy a product and they're told, no, indeed, we monitor the product. Um, we see, the, I think Professor Jim Brudney of Fordham Law School has done some very interesting work in this regard. He has a law review article slated for publication this spring or summer in the P Comparative Labor Law and Policy Journal and called Envisioning Enforcement of Freedom of Association Standards in Corporate Codes, colon, this isn't a strange case, this is a journey for Sinbad or Sisyphus. <laughs> and, he points to the fact that there may be several options for private enforcement of corporate codes based on extensive research he does, such as possible causes of actions by employees for that they now have lawsuits based on employee handbook doctrine. That is, you're a worker in one of these factories, you rely on Apple's publication, and is it, is, is it like an employee handbook? And will Apple really want to put in its handbook we disclaim that this is not enforceable. Um, the other issue might be lawsuits which employees pursue as rights of third party beneficiaries again, like was done in the Walmart case, or, or actions under the alien tort statute. Now we did hear a little bit about that. We may not be on solid ground in a, another year on that question, but it's still something that we should keep our eye on. Uh, Professor Bredney also points out Kasky v. Nike, which was a case in California as, uh, as an interesting example. And there, the California Supreme Court ruled that false statements made by Nike about to letters to its consumers about the labor conditions in its supplier factories were actionable under state law to present, prevent consumer deception. The court viewed the letters as commercial speech 
subject to the state law regulating false and misleading statements made with intent to dispose of goods and services. Very interesting area. I think we might see some development in state and local jurisdictions. I know there are people in this room who are talking about federal, about procurement policies and about how you might enforce them in the state and local levels. Others believe the more likely scenario for U.S. litigation um, in these areas would be generated other, under other emerging mechanisms, such as the uh, RUGI principles, the UN guiding principles for business and human rights that are, for example, contained in the World Bank IF, IFC loan, uh, rules for loans to private developers, and the UN Global Compact, and again, people have mentioned the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises. To the extent that the RUGI principles require due diligence on the part of business to assess likely human rights violations, could that open the door for litigation in U.S. courts that the corporation did not use due diligence as it had committed to do? If companies voluntarily make commitments to meet certain standards, and I think Stefan raised this, um, such as those in the UN Global Compact, shouldn't there be a way to enforce these commitments when it is an important factor for decisions by company investors um, using a CSR index or by consumers relying on purported brand commitments? And I think it's very interesting to look at these CSR indexes that are, that are being created. Europe does, as Lance mentioned, have ones that are very effective. They, investors care about how the ILO viewed a particular company's practices um, with respect to whether it's a proper investment and they will look at a CSR index. And um, if the company is not doing due diligence and saying it does, how, how would it be implicated for whether it's falsely saying to stockholders that it is applying uh, due diligence? Um, in fact, shareholders, including SEIU, brought a case seeking oper operational changes in the company Chiquita Banana, following revelations that the corporate board of directors had knowingly hired paramilitaries in Colombia to eliminate trade union activity in its Columbia, Colombian operations. That case was filed in federal district court in Miami, resulted in a consent decree between the corporation and the shareholders, requiring compliance with freedom of association laws and standards, as well as an agreement to retain a monitor who reported on and ensure compliance with these standards. So in, I just want to, I, I only have about, what, am I, two minutes? Okay, I missed another big area, but luckily you all hopefully have it, or it's been passed out, or it's available. Jeannie Meyer is in the audience. She is president of the International Commission on Labor Rights. There is a case pending right now before the National Labor Relations Board in which we are arguing, um, I said I'm a member of the board, but uh, Jeannie did a fabulous brief on the question of whether the NLRB should be considering ILO core labor standards with respect to um, a question of union, the right of union representatives to have access to the work site to communicate with workers. Now, in this brief, they outline all the CFA decisions, they, the digest of decisions that say work, union representatives must have access to communicate with workers. That's a fundamental aspect of freedom of association and the right to, to join and form unions. And the NLRB right now is considering how should they frame their paradigm for determining this question. It has been generally determined on the basis of discrimination. That is, do they let other certain solicitors on the property, but not union reps, and you can't do that? But why not have a time to be informed by core labor standards, and what we would argue binds the, the U.S. We disagree with, disagree with Stefan on this. We believe that customary international law standards do apply to the U.S., and that indeed, that the fundamental right of the freedom of association, the right of union representatives to be on property, that is a customary international labor core standard that should apply uh, here and that the U.S. is bound to. And we're hoping the NLRB might uh, take occasion to use um, this opportunity to really step up and do something very interesting that provokes this debate in the U.S. court system. So thank you.
We have time. Actually, we, uh, we plan to, to give each of the speakers an opportunity to respond for a few minutes if they want uh, to what was, what's been said. So uh, I'll call Lance. Do you have anything? I'll, I'll pass on my five minutes so there's more time. Okay. Stefan? from the CFA Digest, because I think it is important to, to read what the CFA has said uh, on, the, on the issue of access. And I think it fits in very nicely with um, some of the points that were made about our Constitution and the importance of property rights, uh, and the fact that, um, as well as the fact that um, uh, the Supreme Court has spoken with respect to property rights. This involves this brief the, in the Roundy's case. I just read this and, 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 and sort of talk about how Many different ways this can be interpreted. Um, governments, it's paragraph 1103 out of the uh, CFA's latest fifth edition of, the, um, of their digest of decisions. Um, governments should guarantee the access of trade union representatives to workplaces, and I emphasize the following, with due respect for the rights of property and management so that trade unions can communicate with workers in order to apprise them of the potential advantages of unionization. Now, that's what the CFA says. Our Leachmere case has defined where that line is in terms of what are property rights and what are not property rights. Roundies is going to be considered in connection with this. The NLRB is going to make a decision. Maybe they'll consider these, uh, these, these arguments related to conventions 87 or, or 98. Maybe they won't. Uh, maybe the Circuit Court of Appeals will then, if they do, maybe the Circuit Court of Appeals will address that in the context of it. So we have a, we have a legal system that, exi that exists to apply applicable law and not to incorporate international labor standards. And so this statement and what it means, means a lot of things. Um, that case actually, there was a, the, well, I won't even get into it because it's too, too much detail, but thank but you. But I will say Leachmere, the Supreme Court did not address this question in Leachmere. It did not, it was not, put before them the issue of any customary international labor standards and how they applied in the whole analysis of property rights. And indeed, frankly, right now the SEIU negotiates quite a number of organizing agreements where we, are, we negotiate union access to employer property with due regard and respect for the employer not to, their operations not to be interfered with. And for example, in many of our hospital organizing agreements, we have access to break rooms, cafeterias, smoking areas, um, lobby areas, areas where you normally would not have right of access under the National Labor Relations Act, but we have been able to balance looking at both needs, the right of union access and the right of the employer to be able to efficiently operate its, its work site. A, accommodation for both and I we believe that can occur and that it's time to do that and I think we'll be following this case for some time to come sure. you, get a, you get another opportunity Lance no that's okay, no? okay. <laughs> all right I, I might mention that uh, Leachmere of course re reversed a, a board case called Gene Country uh, with Gene Country the the board uh, granted union access I was one of the board members who voted for union access but as I, as I think back about this case, I don't think the word uh, international was even mentioned. International labor standards was even mentioned in our consideration in, G in Gene Country when we decided that case. Well, the floor is open. It's, your, it's yours. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you. Um, it's, been, it's a very interesting discussion about application of international labor standards to the, the private sector in the U.S. and really interested in hearing uh, contributions people have to make, but I just want to also draw attention to the fact that there is also, um, there are also important developments happening, happening with respect to the application of the international uh, labor standards in the public sector uh, in the United States. Um, uh, Jeannie's organization was involved in a very important case in North Carolina um, in which the Committee of Freedom of Association did hold that North Carolina's ban on public sector collective bargaining violated conventions 87 and 98. And then uh, the Transport Workers Union um, received a decision in November of this year from the CFA uh, uh, finding that uh, New York's uh, broad ban on all public employee strikes and the harsh penalties it imposes, which included uh, fines of millions of dollars, suspension of dues checkoff, imprisonment of the union president for a three-day strike in 2005, 
that, uh, uh, that, that also um, violated um, the principles of freedom of association as reflected in Conventions 87 um, and 98. Um, and uh, it, it, you know, I, I think this panel um, it does, did a really good job of joining um, the issue. Um, and, uh, you know, I think Stefan has sort of uh, uh, tried to carve out uh, probably as, as far as you can reasonably go uh, on the spectrum to argue that courts really have no authority to do anything uh, except apply statutes and the U.S. Constitution. Of course, I think there's an argument that that uh, would kind of rule out the common law uh, and turn us into a, a kind of a code jurisdiction. And of course, it, 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 it completely inter, uh, eliminates any role for customary law, which is a well-established uh, source of international law. So I do, uh, a great panel, I'm really interested in hearing uh, the response the responses that folks have, but I did want to bring in also the fact that there are, are, are important developments happening in the public sector. And given, from a union perspective, the attacks that are happening on public sector workers nationwide, uh, I think the timing of these cases is, is, uh, is important. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm Jeannie Meyer from the International Commission for Labor Rights. Uh, thank you, Judy, for mentioning the brief and others. Um, one of the things I do want to say about the brief is that we did we did track the fact that it's not, you know, just the fundamental principles or the other human rights instruments, but that courts throughout the world have developed this global consensus on the fact that freedom of association and and right of uh, collective bargaining are such are really customary international law, and that the the interpretations given by the CFA. Are, are things that need to be looked at to interpret what that actually means. And that, and, and uh, we cited the European Court of, of Human Rights, which decided a major case in uh, 2007 called the Demir and Bukhira versus Turkey. We cited, we cited the Canadian case in the uh, uh, Supreme Court, which uh, said ILO standards, even though they haven't ratified uh, Convention 98, they said the inherent in the ability to uh, have freedom of association as the right of collective bargaining. And they, it, there's also, we argued these principles in an amicus brief to the Mexican Supreme Court, which has recently decided, in, again, in, to support an interpretation of, of its own domestic law consistent with international standards. So what we're saying is that this isn't just a, you know, we're talking about some outliers here. We're talking about, you know, major, uh, 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 Supreme Courts and, and international courts, which have adopted the same theories that we're talking about here, and in fact, the the the, it argue, the argument in the brief is that instead of looking at whether or not the Girl Scouts were allowed in to see whether a union should be allowed in, if you look at the question of access from a common sense perspective of whether a you know. Um, it, that access is actually fundamental to the right of freedom association. And, you know, you have to consider uh, the issue of management, uh, uh, the ability to be efficient, and give due respect to that. Yes, sir. This uh, Tom Van Harm with uh, Calvert Investments. Uh, we're a socially responsible investment firm up uh, at <coughs> Vesta. And one of our strategies is to engage with companies uh, specifically on labor rights. And we'll also go into a company and they'll be glad to talk about their supply chain uh, and how they uh, you know, have ILO code of conduct for their supply chain. But once we go in and, and ask about uh, ILO, uh, ILO standards for their own domestic employees, you know, uh, they're looking for the exit. Um, so that's one issue that, that really stands out. And then even if we go a, a level lower and say, you know, with the recent NLR, NLRB poster rule, you know, will you come out and say something against either Chamber of Commerce or NAM, you know, who are opposing the NLRB poster rule, you know, you can forget about it uh, as far as getting any dialogue with, with labor standards. So I guess my question to the panel is, what should we be asking for? Is there room to, you know, apply investor pressure or you know, we work with a lot of coalitions or NGO pressure to sort of aspire for higher? You know, we, we can start with the NLRB and the NLRA, but can we get higher? Um, I, I'm for trying to get everything that we can. Um, <laughs> I, I, I think that um, you know there we there are examples. I'm, I'm thinking now of uh, where companies have 
rectify, even some of the worst performers have rectified and corrected their actions. I'm thinking of uh, First Student. I don't know if people are familiar with First Student. It's, a, it's the major, it's the largest private school bus contractor in the United States. And for years and years, it's also a European company. And actually, originally, First Student was going to be part of the Human Rights Watch report, but they changed their ways in time to <laughs> save them from being included in the report. Um, because, and it was exactly on this question, it's an example of the, you know, soft law at work having hard effects, if you want to put it that way. Um, they were running standard American management style anti-union campaigns throughout the United States whenever school bus drivers in school districts around the country, this is private sector, right? remember this is not public, this is where the local school district contracts out to a private uh, provider, the, the school bus contract. And they were doing the usual anti-union stuff. And the uh, unions, at first it was the uh, Teamsters and the SEIU in a coalition, and, the, and then the SEIU kind of handed it off to the Teamsters. Uh, but they began going to the company's shareholders meetings in uh, Aberdeen, Scotland. That's where the company uh, is headquartered. Um, and hammering away at the board of directors and, and, and engaging the, the, uh, the British trade union allies. And that's another important thing about these international labor standards having force in the United States, notwithstanding their lack of direct legal effect. In most of Europe, uh, ILO conventions and ILO uh, uh, standards and the decisions of the ILO Committee on Freedom of Association are taken very seriously. Um, and they're taken as an indication of whether there's compliance with these uh, basic human rights. And the, the combined effort uh, of, of uh, naming and shaming and uh, shareholder activism and rallying support in Europe and, and at the same time strong organizing on the ground in the United States convinced that company to, um, to, 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 to turn, it did a 180 degree turn. It issued a, a genuine human rights policy, a freedom of association policy. It set up an entirely within the company private, almost like a private NLRB. In fact, uh, your former chairman, <laughs> Chairman Gould, um, they chose Bill Gould from Stanford to be the administrator of their uh, in-house freedom of association uh, uh, um, program. And since that time, the union has organized, successfully organized about 30,000 bus drivers. And the organizing is still continuing. Uh, most recently, they actually reached a national agreement with the company for kind of a, a framework agreement, uh, and then there will be local supplemental agreements and so on. But it's, it's a real example of what is possible um, and, you know, that's an example of a company that didn't go running for the exits. I mean, they weren't, they didn't come, they didn't come uh, uh, willingly. They were kind of forced to the table and forced to this by, by dint of some strong organizing and pressure and alliance building with workers and unions in other countries. Um, <clears throat> but that's what it's going to take. I, I'm not in the least surprised that, you know, companies that might have the best record in terms of what they're trying to do for their supply chain, if you say, what about your workers in the United States? I'm, I'm thinking of, you know, Reebok. I mean, Reebok has been swallowed up by Adidas, but a few years ago, Reebok was a real trendsetter, a pace setter. Uh, 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 it was in the vanguard of the corporate social responsibility, international rights, labor rights for workers in their supply chain. When the Teamsters launched an organizing campaign at the Reebok warehouse in Massachusetts, it was the same old, same old. You know, the same chairman of the company, Paul Firestone, I think his name is, you know, who was out there saying, we're for the ILO core labor standards. He was doing his videos about, if you bring a union in here, the union is a bunch of liars and thieves and crooks, and we're gonna, if you go on strike, we're gonna permanently replace you, and boom, 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 boom. You know, an absolute, in my point of view, Jekyll and Hyde performance. You know, Julie, did you wanna, yeah. Yeah, on that, um, it goes also to the importance of global union alliances. Uh, with respect to that particular, company, uh, first student, I remember we were lining up counsel in, um, in Scotland to, uh, because the British trade unionists who held the stock had rarely ever exercised their right to go to the shareholder meetings. And this is something that in the U.S. we have do a lot more frequently. But um, we, we activated, uh, working with our global union partner, activated people to get their shares to go got counsel there ready to get them into the meetings and were able to raise these issues. And in, as, as Lance says, in European countries, this is considered um, a question that corporate shareholders want to know about and care about. Boards of directors do care about where they stand 
on uh, social responsive, corporate social responsibility. And, and uh, in fact, some of the shareholder statutes now actually reference these issues um, as something that is uh, that the shareholder has has the right to know about, and um, and the corporation has a duty to comply with. So it, it can be a very effective device um, and strategy, but with real life implications back here in the U.S. Fred, uh, I'm based at the University of Maryland, and I, I think this hard soft conversation is very interesting, and I, I think it's important to also. Reflect a little when you take just the domestic context, just the enforcement of labor policies, labor law in this country, which is a pretty hard regime. I mean, we have the National Labor Relations Act, we have a whole series of laws, and yet, you know, many uh, are very critical of the effectiveness of the hard law regime, hard law enforcement in a domestic context. So, which isn't to say, I mean, it's important. That hard law isn't important, isn't relevant, but it's certainly not the whole story. And I think that when we, then when we move to this international context, I, I mean, I think that history, the domestic history, is instructive. And to effectively raise standards, I think you need to both have considerations like today of how to better uh, bring about hard law enforcement. But it, I mean, I think that the soft law, if you will, is in some sense even, certainly as interesting, uh, and what are the potentials and, and the possibilities there. And, and, and in Judy's uh, description of some of the things that are now coming into these IFA, these international framework agreements, again, this hard soft is a, a little, it's beginning to get confusing to me because you reference arbitration as enforcement and so forth. Um, that is, is that soft, is that hard? I mean, I guess that's soft. But in the first student context, it was that kind of an internal force enforcement mechanism that ultimately proved to be one of the most effective things that turned it around. So I think that in this conversation, the balance and the understanding, the understanding of both hard and soft and how they play off of each other and how they're related to each other and how the, you know, the soft is very much a part of this is important. And so I would have a question for Stefan and anybody else is in this context, what, in your experience, what motivates companies, uh, enterprises, to enter into these agreements, into these framework agreements, into uh, uh, codes of conduct, and so forth? Um, you know, what gets them in that place in the first place? Because it, it would seem to me that that is certainly relevant in understanding how better to implement and enforce them. Um. It runs the spectrum in terms of what gets people to enter into these agreements. Uh, if we talk about international framework agreements, I think there are really only two in the United States, and they're really very aspirational documents. The vast majority of those agreements are entered into by European companies. Um, there is one or two in Brazil uh, from Brazilian corporations. But for the most part, it's a different dynamic in Europe. I think I think Lance pointed that out very extensively in his in his uh, in his uh, work, A Strange Case. Um, in terms of corporate codes of conduct and corporate codes of social responsibility, I think there's been a lot of uh, naming and shaming that has gone on throughout uh, throughout the 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 past I don't know how many years. Uh, related to sweatshops. It started with some of the sweatshops involving some, some very large apparel companies, um, but it has also expanded quite a bit, and it is uh, very popular because companies want to project uh, a persona of being a responsible corporate citizen because it protects their brand. It makes them look good. It makes them, you know, if you look at the environmental, in the environmental debate, uh, all, every company in the world was trying to be green. Okay. And so those are the things that motivate them to do that. Um, and I think organized labor has been very effective at capitalizing on those, those issues. And the first student, I think I don't know anything about the details of it, but that's an example and some of the other examples that have, that, 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 that have occurred over time. I think that's what motivates, you know, so that's, that's I, I think that's my, my sort of 50,000 foot view, but lots of companies, 
Lots, you know, I, and I will say this, a lot of companies enter into these agreements and they haven't a clue what they've signed. Okay, because they don't call me until after the fact. <laughs> Judge Massetti. I'm really intrigued by this hard soft station. And I'm not... Here, there's a lot of irony in this. Think about this for a moment. If, in fact, embodied in a contract is referenced to an international labor standard, you don't have to go to the NLRB. You come to court. You don't even have to cite the NLR, NLRB jurisprudence. You cite the international standard because that's the contract standard. It may be an unfair labor practice, and you may be able to go to the NLRB, but you don't have to. You've got a much easier path, and you go, and here's the irony. What controls is the international labor standard, not the local juris domestic jurisprudence. Makes a lot of sense. And then what you get, if you begin to develop jurisprudence based on contractual interpretation of what is unreasonable interference with access to the workplace, you are creating hard law. You're creating hard case law, which as you've imported intellectual, uh, in international standards in the future, courts can refer to when you're talking about a contract that imports an inter international standard. You really aren't imprisoned at all by the local jurisprudence. You can cite it, but you're not bound by it. Hey, look, district courts all the time have to answer questions like, what is an unreasonable restraint of trade? What is an unreasonable restraint of access to the workplace? Couldn't a court hearing evidence, witnesses say, look, if you're, if you're, I'm, I want to be careful because I might get this case. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I see this arguably, I see this arguably as coming to a judge. Please so be careful. <laughs> but think about it. Just, just to think, talk about this hypothetically. If, if you are saying, look, we want to come to the workplace, but we are up against the fact that these same people who we only get to talk to after hours in the smoking rooms are hit 10 times a day, mandatorily, by people, that's unfair interference. Well, that's something that will restrain the trade, or at least you make the same argument. And again, you're not bound at all by what, what, what the Supreme Court says, necessarily, because you're just interpreting a contract based on an international uh, labor standard, that's the first source of reference. So it's an interesting irony, it becomes soft law becomes hard law in time. And that's really an interesting approach. That's really where I think you might go. And as I say, you could go to the NLRB, don't want to take away your business, John, and everybody else's, but there's a direct route to the courts on something like that. Judge, you have the last word. Uh, it's four o'clock. Uh, the bar is set up outside. Let me first let me thank, thank my colleagues on the panel. I, there, there, are, there, are, there are little mementos here for them. I want to first, I want to thank, I want to put Nancy on for one second, but let me thank her first. Thank you, Nancy and Karen for letting me be part of this. International labor law is not my field, and they have made me, uh, they've educated me. I've had a wonderful time working with them. It's been a lot of fun, and there's a reception outside. Nancy. Um, emails so people could communicate with each other. Um, and uh, we didn't ask that when we registered, but I think I'll send an email around and ask people to tell me if they don't want to be included on the list, and then we'll go ahead and share it with people, uh, just because it would be good to continue the conversation. So let's go outside and have a drink. <laughs> Thank you.